It is said in the practice of Vedanta that we have a right to work but don't have a right to the result of our actions. I am Vandana and I will be taking you through the book Karma Yoga by Swami Vivekananda. Many of Swami Vivekananda's books are based on his lectures and Karma Yoga is one of these. This book contains 8 lectures delivered by him on the practical application of the teachings of Vedanta to the affairs of daily life. We have to work as hard as we can. Give the work our best quality effort. Then step back and let the results take care of themselves. To quote him, you need not worry and spend sleepless nights thinking about what would happen to the world. It will go on without you the way it has been. So sit back and enjoy. Chapter 1 Karma in its effect on character. The word karma is derived from the Sanskrit kri to do. All action is karma. Technically, this word also means the effects of actions. In connection with metaphysics, it sometimes means the effects of which our past actions were the causes. But in karma yoga, we have simply to do with the word karma as meaning work. The goal of mankind is knowledge. That is the one ideal placed before us by eastern philosophy. Pleasure is not the goal of man, but knowledge. Pleasure and happiness come to an end. It is a mistake to suppose that pleasure is the goal. The cause of all the miseries we have in the world is that men foolishly think pleasure to be the ideal to strive for. After a time man finds that it is not happiness but knowledge towards which he is going and that both pleasure and pain are great teachers and that he learns as much from evil as from good. As pleasure and pain pass before his soul they have upon it different pictures and the result of these combined impressions is what is called man's character. If you take the character of any man it really is but the aggregate of tendencies the sum total of the bent of his mind you will find that misery and happiness are equal factors in the formation of that character good and evil have an equal share in molding character and in some instances misery is a greater teacher than happiness in studying the great characters the world has produced I dare say in the vast majority of cases it would be found that it was misery that taught more than happiness it was poverty that taught more than wealth it was blows that brought out the inner fire more than praise now this knowledge again is inherent in man no knowledge comes from outside it is all inside What we say a man knows should in strict psychological language be what he discovers or unveils what a man learns is really what he discovers by taking the cover of his own soul which is a mine of infinite knowledge we say newton discovered gravitation was it sitting anywhere in a corner waiting for him It was in his own mind. The time came and he found it out. All knowledge that the world has ever received comes from the mind. The infinite library of the universe is in your own mind. The external world is simply the suggestion, the occasion which sets you to study your own mind. But the object of your study is always your own mind. The falling of an apple gave the suggestion to Newton and he studied his own mind. He rearranged all the previous links of thought in his mind and discovered a new link among them which we call the law of gravitation. It was not in the apple nor in anything in the center of the earth. All knowledge therefore 
secular or spiritual is in the human mind in many cases it is not discovered but remains covered and when the covering is being slowly taken off we say we are learning and the advance of knowledge is made by the advance of this process of uncovering the man from whom this veil is being lifted is the more knowing man the man upon whom it lies thick is ignorant and the man from whom it has entirely gone is all knowing omniscient there have been omniscient men and i believe there will be yet and that there will be myriads of them in the cycles to come like fire in a piece of flint knowledge exists in the mind suggestion is the friction that brings it out so with all our feelings and actions our tears and our smiles our joys and our griefs our weeping and our laughter our curses and our blessings our praises and our blames every one of these we may find if we calmly study our own selves to have been brought out from within ourselves by so many blows the result is what we are all these blows taken together are called karma work action every mental and physical blow that is given to the soul by which as it were far is struck from it and by which its own power and knowledge are discovered is karma this word being used in its widest sense thus we are all doing karma all the time i am talking to you that is karma you are listening that is karma we breathe that is karma we walk karma everything we do physical or mental is karma and it leaves its marks on us there are certain works which are as it were the aggregate the sum total of a large number of smaller works if we stand near the seashore and hear the waves dashing against the shingle we think it is such a great noise and yet we know that one wave is really composed of millions and millions of minute waves each one of these is making a noise and yet we do not catch it it is only when they become the big aggregate that we hear similarly every pulsation of the heart is work certain kinds of work we feel and they become tangible to us they are at the same time the aggregate of a number of small works if you really want to judge of the character of a man look not at his great performances every fool may become a hero at one time or another watch a man do his most common actions those are indeed the things which will tell you the real character of a great man great occasions rouse even the lowest of human beings to some kind of greatness but he alone is the really great man whose character is great always the same wherever he be karma in its effect on character is the most tremendous power that man has to deal with man is as it were a center and is attracting all the powers of the universe towards himself and in this center is fusing them all and again sending them off in a big current such a center is the real man the almighty the omniscient and he draws the whole universe towards him good and bad misery and happiness are all running towards him and clinging round him and out of them he fashions the mighty stream of tendency called character and throws it outwards as he has the power of drawing in anything so has he the power of throwing it out all the actions that we see in the world all the movements in human society all the works that we have around us are simply the display of thought the manifestation of the will of man machines or instruments cities ships or men of war 
all these are simply the manifestation of the will of man and this will is caused by character and character is manufactured by karma as is karma so is the manifestation of the will the men of mighty will the world has produced have all been tremendous workers gigantic souls with wills powerful enough to overturn worlds wills they got by persistent work through ages and ages such a gigantic will as that of a buddha or a jesus could not be obtained in one life for we know who their fathers were it is not known that their fathers ever spoke a word for the good of mankind millions and millions of carpenters like joseph had gone millions are still living millions and millions of petty kings like buddha's father had been in the world if it was only a case of hereditary transmission how do you account for this petty prince who was not perhaps obeyed by his own servants producing this son whom half a world worships how do you explain the gulf between the carpenter and his son whom millions of human beings worship as god it cannot be solved by the theory of heredity the gigantic will which buddha and jesus threw over the world whence did it come whence came this accumulation of power it must have been there through ages and ages continually growing bigger and bigger until it burst on society in a buddha or a jesus even rolling down to the present day all this is determined by karma work no one can get anything unless he earns it this is an eternal law we may sometimes think it is not so but in the long run we become convinced of it a man may struggle all his life for riches he may cheat thousands but he finds at last that he did not deserve to become rich and his life becomes a trouble and a nuisance to him we may go on accumulating things for our physical enjoyment but only what we earn is really ours a fool may buy all the books in the world and they will be in his library but he will be able to read only those that he deserves to and this deserving is produced by karma our karma determines what we deserve and what we can assimilate we are responsible for what we are and whatever we wish ourselves to be we have the power to make ourselves if what we are now has been the result of our own past actions it certainly follows that whatever we wish to be in future can be produced by our present actions so we have to know how to act you will say what is the use of learning how to work everyone works in some way or the other in this world but there is such a thing as filtering away our energies with regard to karma yoga the gita says that it is doing work with cleverness and as a science by knowing how to work one can obtain the greatest results you must remember that all work is simply to bring out the power of the mind which is already there to wake up the soul the power is inside every man so is knowing the different works are like blows to bring them out to cause these giants to wake up man works with various motives they cannot be work without motive some people want to get fame and they work for fame others want money and they work for money others want to have power and they work for power others want to get to heaven and they work for the same others want to leave a name when they die as they do in china where no man gets a title until he is dead and that is a better way after all than with us when a man does something very good there they give a title of nobility to his father who is dead or to his grandfather some people work for that some of the followers of certain mohammedan sects work all the lives to have a big tomb built for them when they die i know six among whom 
as soon as a child is born a tomb is prepared for it that is among them the most important work a man has to do and the bigger and the finer the tomb the better off the man is supposed to be others work as a penance do all sorts of wicked things then erect a temple or give something to the priests to buy them off and obtain from them a passport to heaven they think that this kind of beneficence will clear them and they will go scot free in spite of their sinfulness such are some of the various motives for work work for work's sake there are some who are really the salt of the earth in every country and who work for work's sake who do not care for name or fame or even to go to heaven they work just because good will come of it there are others who do good to the poor and help mankind from still higher motives because they believe in doing good and love good the motive for name and fame seldom brings immediate results as a rule they come to us when we are old and have almost done with life if a man works without any selfish motive in view does he not gain anything yes he gains the highest unselfishness is more paying only people have not the patience to practice it it is more paying from the point of view of health also love shut and unselfishness are not merely moral figures of speech but they form our highest ideal because in them lies such a manifestation of power in the first place a man who can work for 5 days or even for 5 minutes without any selfish motive whatever without thinking of future of heaven of punishment or anything of the kind has in him the capacity to become a powerful moral giant it is hard to do it but in the heart of our hearts we know its value and the good it brings it is the greatest manifestation of power this tremendous restraint self restraint is a manifestation of greater power than all outgoing action a carriage with four horses may rush down a hill unrestrained or the coachman may curb the horses which is the greater manifestation of power to let them go or to hold them a cannon ball flying through the air goes a long distance and falls another is cut short in his flight by striking against a wall and the impact generates intense heat all outgoing energy following a selfish motive is frittered away it will not cause power to return to you but if restrained it will result in development of power this self control will tend to produce a mighty will a character which makes a christ or a buddha foolish men do not know this secret they nevertheless want to rule mankind even a fool may rule the whole world if he works and waits let him wait a few years restrain that foolish idea of governing and when that idea is wholly gone he will be a power in the world the majority of us cannot see beyond a few years just as some animals cannot see beyond a few steps just a little narrow circle that is our world we have not the patience to look beyond and thus become immoral and wicked this is our weakness our powerlessness even the lowest forms of work are not to be despised let the man who knows no better work for selfish ends for name and fame but everyone should always try to get towards higher and higher motives and to understand them to work we have the right but not to the fruits thereof leave the fruits alone why care for results if you wish to help a man never think what that man's attitude should be towards you if you want to do a great or good work do not trouble to think what the result will be there arises a difficult question in this ideal of work intense activity is necessary we must always work we cannot live a minute without work what then becomes of rest here is one side of the life struggle work in which we are whirled rapidly around 
and here is the other that of calm retiring renunciation everything is peaceful around there is very little of noise and show only nature with her animals and flowers and mountains neither of them is a perfect picture a man used to solitude if brought in contact with the surging whirlpool of the world will be crushed by it just as the fish that lives in the deep sea water as soon as it brought to the surface breaks into pieces deprived of the weight of water on it that had kept it together can a man who has been used to the turmoil and the rush of life live at ease if he comes to a quiet place he suffers and perchance may lose his mind the ideal man is he who in the midst of the greatest silence and solitude finds the silence and solitude of the desert he has learned the secret of restraint he has controlled himself he goes through the streets of a big city with all its traffic and his mind is as calm as if he were in a cave where not a sound could reach him and he is intensely working all the time that is the ideal of karma yoga and if you have attained to that you have really learned the secret of work but we have to begin from the beginning to take up the works as they come to us and slowly make ourselves more unselfish every day we must do the work and find out the motive power that prompts us and almost without exception in the first years we shall find that our motives are always selfish but gradually the selfishness will melt by persistence till at last will come the time when we shall be able to do really unselfish work we may all hope that some day or other as we struggle through the paths of life there will come a time when we shall become perfectly unselfish and the moment we attain to that all our powers will be concentrated and the knowledge which is ours will be manifest chapter 2 each is great in his own place according to the sankhya philosophy nature is composed of three forces called in sanskrit sattva rajas and tamas these as manifested in the physical world are what we may call equilibrium activity and inertness tamas is typified as darkness or inactivity rajas is activity expressed as attraction or repulsion and sattva is the equilibrium of the two in every man there are these three forces sometimes tamas prevails we become lazy we cannot move we are inactive bound down by certain ideas or by mere dullness at other times activity prevails and at still other times that calm balancing of both again in different men one of these forces is generally predominant the characteristic of one man is inactivity dullness and laziness that of another activity power manifestation of energy and in still another we find the sweetness calmness and gentleness which are due to the balancing of both action and inaction so in all creation in animals plants and men we find the more or less typical manifestation of all these different forces karma yoga has specially to deal with these three factors by teaching what they are and how to employ them it helps us to do our work better human society is a graded organization we all know about morality and we all know about duty but at the same time we find that in different countries the significance of morality varies greatly what is regarded as moral in one country may in another be considered perfectly immoral for instance in one country cousins may marry in another it is thought to be very immoral in one men may marry their sisters in law in another it is regarded as immoral in one country people may marry only once in another many times and so forth 
similarly in all other departments of morality we find the standard varies greatly yet we have the idea that there must be a universal standard of morality so it is with duty the idea of duty varies much among different nations in one country if a man does not do certain things people will say he has acted wrongly while if he does those very things in another country people will say that he did not act rightly and yet we know that there must be some universal idea of duty in the same way one class of society thinks that certain things are among its duty while another class thinks quite the opposite and would be horrified if it had to do those things two ways are left open to us the way of the ignorant who think that there is only one way to truth and that all the rest are wrong and the way of the wise who admit that according to our mental constitution or the different planes of existence in which we are duty and morality may vary the important thing is to know that there are gradations of duty and of morality that the duty of one state of life in one set of circumstances will not and cannot be that of another to illustrate all great teachers have taught resist not evil that non resistance is the highest moral ideal we all know that if a certain number of us attempted to put that maxim fully into practice the whole social fabric would fall to pieces the wicked would take possession of our properties and our lives and would do whatever they like with us even if only one day of such non resistance were practiced it would lead to disaster yet intuitively in our heart of hearts we feel the truth of the teaching resist not evil this seems to us to be the highest ideal yet to teach this doctrine only would be equivalent to condemning a vast portion of mankind not only so it would be making men feel that they were always doing wrong and cause in them scruples of conscience in all their actions it would weaken them and that constant self of disapproval would breed more vice than any other weakness would to the man who has begun to hate himself the gate to degeneration has already opened and the same is true of a nation our first duty is not to hate ourselves because to advance we must have faith in ourselves first and then in god he who has no faith in himself can never have faith in god Therefore the only alternative remaining to us is to recognize that duty and morality vary under different circumstances not that the man who resists evil is doing what is always and itself wrong but that in the different circumstances in which he is placed it may become even his duty to resist evil in reading the bhagavad gita many of you in western countries may have felt astonished at the second chapter wherein shri krishna calls arjuna a hypocrite and a coward because of his refusal to fight or offer resistance on account of his adversaries being his friends and relatives making the plea that non resistance was the highest ideal of love this is a great lesson for us all to learn that in all matters the two extremes are alike the extreme positive and the extreme negative are always similar when the vibrations of light are too slow we do not see them nor do we see them when they are too rapid so with sound when very low in pitch we do not hear it when very high we do not hear it either of like nature is the difference between resistance and non resistance one man does not resist because he is weak lazy and cannot not because he will not the other man knows that he can strike an irresistible blow if he likes yet he not only does not strike but blesses his enemies the one who from weakness resists not commits a sin and as such cannot receive any benefit from the non resistance while the other would commit a sin by offering resistance 
Buddha gave up his throne and renounced his position. That was true renunciation. But there cannot be any question of renunciation in the case of a beggar who has nothing to renounce. So we must always be careful about what we really mean when we speak of this non-resistance and ideal love. We must first take care to understand whether we have the power of resistance or not. Then, having the power, if we renounce it and do not resist, we are doing a grand act of love. But if we cannot resist and yet at the same time try to deceive ourselves into the belief that we are actuated by motives of the highest love, we are doing the exact opposite. Arjuna became a coward at the sight of the mighty array against him. His love made him forget his duty towards his country and king. That is why Sri Krishna told him that he was a hypocrite. Thou talkest like a wise man, but thy actions betray thee to be a coward. Therefore, stand up and fight. Such is the central idea of Karma Yoga. The Karma Yogi is the man who understands that the highest ideal is non-resistance and who also knows that this non-resistance is the highest manifestation of power in actual possession. And also what is called the resisting of evil is but a step on the way towards the manifestation of this highest power, namely non-resistance. Before reaching this highest ideal, man's duty is to resist evil. Let him work, let him fight, let him strike straight from the shoulder. Then only when he has gained the power to resist, will non-resistance be a virtue. I once met a man in my country whom I had known before as a very stupid, dull person who knew nothing and had not the desire to know anything and was living the life of a brute. He asked me what he should do to know God, how he was to get free. Can you tell a lie? I asked him. No, he replied. Then you must learn to do so. It is better to tell a lie than to be a brute or a log of wood. You are inactive. You have not certainly reached the higher state, which is beyond all actions, calm and serene. You are too dull even to do something wicked. That was an extreme case, of course, and I was joking with him. But what I meant was that a man must be active in order to pass through activity to perfect calmness. Inactivity should be avoided by all means. Activity always means resistance. Resist all evils, mental and physical. And when you have succeeded in resisting, then will calmness come. It is very easy to say, hate nobody, resist not evil. But we know what that kind of thing generally means in practice. When the eyes of society are turned towards us, we may make a show of non-resistance, but in our hearts, it is canker all the time. We feel the utter want of the calm of non-resistance. We feel that it would be better for us to resist. If you desire wealth and know at the same time that the whole world regards him who aims at wealth as a very wicked man, you perhaps will not dare to plunge into the struggle for wealth. Yet your mind will be running day and night after money. This is hypocrisy and will serve no purpose. Plunge into the world. And then after a time when you have suffered and enjoyed all that is in it, will renunciation come? Then will calmness come? So fulfill your desire for power and everything else. And after you have fulfilled the desire, will come the time when you will know that they are very little things. But until you have fulfilled this desire, until you have passed through that activity, it is impossible for you to come to the state of calmness serenity and self-surrender. These ideas of serenity and renunciation have been preached for thousands of years. Everybody has heard of them from childhood. And yet, we see very few in the world who have really reached that stage. 
I do not know if I have seen 20 persons in my life who are really calm and non-resisting and I have travelled over half the world. Every man should take up his own ideal and endeavour to accomplish it. That is a surer way of progress than taking up other men's ideals which he can never hope to accomplish. For instance, we take a child and at once give him the task of walking 20 miles. Either the little one dies or one in a thousand crawls the 20 miles to reach the end exhausted and half dead. That is like what we generally try to do with the world. All the men and women in any society are not of the same mind, capacity or of the same power to do things. They must have different ideals and we have no right to sneer at any ideal. Let everyone do the best he can for realizing his own ideal. Nor is it right that I should be judged by your standard or you by mine. The apple tree should not be judged by the standard of the oak, nor the oak by that of the apple. To judge the apple tree, you must take the apple standard and for the oak, its own standard. Unity in variety is the plan of creation. However, men and women may vary individually. There is unity in the background. The different individual characters and classes of men and women are natural variations in creation. Hence, we ought not to judge them by the same standard or put the same ideal before them. Such a course creates only an unnatural struggle and the result is that man begins to hate himself and is hindered from becoming religious and good. Our duty is to encourage everyone in his struggle to live up to his own highest ideal and strive at the same time to make the ideal as near as possible to the truth. In the Hindu system of morality, we find that this fact has been recognized from very ancient times and in their scriptures and books on ethics, different rules are laid down for the different classes of men, the householder, the sannyasin, the man who has renounced the world and the student. The life of every individual, according to the Hindu scriptures, has its peculiar duties apart from what belongs in common to universal humanity. The Hindu begins life as a student, then he marries and becomes a householder. In old age, he retires and lastly he gives up the world and becomes a sannyasin. To each of these stages of life, certain duties are attached. No one of these stages is intrinsically superior to another. The life of the married man is quite as great as that of the celibate who has devoted himself to religious work. The scavenger in the street is quite as great and glorious as a king on his throne. Take him off his throne, make him do the work of the scavenger and see how he fares. Take up the scavenger and see how he will rule. It is useless to say that the man who lives out of the world is a greater man than who lives in the world. It is much more difficult to live in the world and worship God than to give it up and live a free and easy life. The four stages of life in India have in later times been reduced to two, that of the householder and of the monk. The householder marries and carries on his duties as a citizen and the duty of the other is to devote his energies wholly to religion, to preach and to worship God. I shall read to you a few passages from the Maha Nirvana Tantra which treats of this subject and you will see that it is a very difficult task for a man to be a householder and perform all his duties perfectly. The householder should be devoted to God. The knowledge of God should be his goal of life. Yet, he must work constantly, perform all his duties. He must give up the fruits of his actions to God. It is a most difficult thing in this world to work and not care for the result. To help a man and never think that he ought to be grateful. To do some good work and at the same time never look to see whether it brings you name or fame or nothing at all. Even the most errant coward becomes brave when the world praises him. A fool can do heroic deeds when the approbation of society is upon him. 
but for a man to constantly do good things without caring for the approbation of his fellow men is indeed the highest sacrifice man can perform the great duty of the householder is to earn a living but he must take care that he does not do it by telling lies or by cheating or by robbing others and he must remember that his life is for the service of god and the poor knowing that mother and father are the visible representatives of god the householder always and by all means must please them if the mother is pleased and the father god is pleased with the man that child is really a good child who never speaks harsh words to his parents before parents one must not utter jokes must not show restlessness must not show anger or temper before mother or father a child must bow down low and stand up in their presence and must not take a seat until they order him to sit if the householder has food and drink and clothes without first seeing that his mother and his father his children his wife and the poor are supplied he is committing a sin the mother and the father are the causes of this body so a man must undergo a thousand troubles in order to do good to them even so is his duty to his wife no man should scold his wife and he must always maintain her as if she were his own mother and even when he is in the greatest difficulties and troubles he must not show anger to his wife he who thinks of another woman besides his wife if he touches her even with his mind that man goes to dark hell before women we must not talk improper language and never brag of his powers he must not say i have done this and i have done that the householder must always please his wife with money clothes love faith and words like nectar and never do anything to disturb her that man who has succeeded in getting the love of a chaste wife has succeeded in his religion and has all the virtues the following are duties towards children a son should be lovingly reared up to his fourth year he should be educated till he is 16 When he is 20 years of age he should be employed in some work he should then be treated affectionately by his father as his equal exactly in the same manner the daughter should be brought up and should be educated with the greatest care and when she marries the father ought to give her jewels and wealth then the duty of the man is towards his brothers and sisters and towards the children of his brothers and sisters if they are poor and towards his other relatives his friends and his servants then his duties are towards the people of the same village and the poor and any one that comes to him for help having sufficient means if the householder does not take care to give to his relatives and to the poor know him to be only a brute his is not a human being excessive attachment to food clothes and the tending of the body and dressing of the hair should be avoided the householder must be pure in heart and clean in body always active and always ready for work to his enemies the householder must be a hero them he must resist that is the duty of the householder he must not sit down in a corner and weep and talk nonsense about non resistance If he does not show himself a hero to his enemies he has not done his duty and to his friends and relatives he must be as gentle as a lamb it is a duty of the householder not to pay reverence to the wicked because if he reverences the wicked people of the world he patronizes wickedness and it will be a great mistake if he disregards those who are worthy of respect the good people He must not be gushing in his friendship. He must not go out of the way making friends everywhere. He must watch the actions of the men he wants to make friends with and their dealings with other men, reason upon them and then make friends. These three things he must not talk of. He must not talk in public of his own fame. He must not preach his own name 
or his own powers. He must not talk of his wealth or of anything that has been told to him privately. A man must not say he is poor or that he is wealthy. He must not brag of his wealth. Let him keep his own counsel. This is his religious duty. This is not mere worldly wisdom. If a man does not do so, he may be held to be immoral. The householder is the basis, the prop and the whole society. He is the principal earner. The poor, the weak, the children and the women who do not work all live upon the householder. So there must be certain duties that he has to perform and these duties must make him feel strong to perform them and not make him think that he is doing things beneath his ideal. Therefore, if he has done something weak or has made some mistake, he must not say so in public. And if he is engaged in some enterprise and knows he is sure to fail in it, he must not speak of it. Such self-exposure is not only uncalled for, but also unnerves the man and makes him unfit for the performance of his legitimate duties in life. At the same time, he must struggle hard to acquire these things. Firstly, knowledge and secondly, wealth. It is his duty and if he does not do his duty, he is nobody. A householder who does not struggle to get wealth is immoral. If he is lazy and content to lead an ideal life, he is immoral because upon him depends hundreds. If he gets riches, hundreds of others will be thereby supported. If there were not in this city hundreds who had striven to become rich and who had acquired wealth, where would all this civilization and these almhouses and great houses be? Going after wealth in such a case is not bad because that wealth is for distribution. The householder is the center of life and society. It is a worship for him to acquire and spend wealth nobly for the householder who struggles to become rich by good means and for good purposes is doing practically the same thing for the attainment of salvation as the anchorite does in his cell when he is praying. For in them we see only the different aspects of the same virtue of self-surrender and self-sacrifice prompted by the feeling of devotion to God and to all that is His. He must struggle to acquire a good name by all means. He must not gamble. He must not move in the company of the wicked. He must not tell lies and must not be the cause of trouble to others. Often people enter into things they have not the means to accomplish, with the result that they cheat others to attain their own ends. Then there is in all things the time factor to be taken into consideration. What at one time might be a failure would perhaps at another time be a very great success. The householder must speak the truth and speak gently, using words which people like which will do good to others nor should he talk of the business of other men. The householder by digging tanks, by planting trees on the roadsides, by establishing rest houses for men and animals, by making roads and building bridges, goes towards the same goal as the greatest yogi. This is one part of the doctrine of Karma Yoga. Activity, the duty of the householder. There is a passage later on where it says that if the householder dies in battle, fighting for his country or his religion, he comes to the same goal as the yogi by meditation, showing thereby that what is duty for one is not duty for another. At the same time, it does not say that this duty is lowering and the other elevating. Each duty has its own place and according to the circumstances in which we are placed, must we perform our duties. One idea comes out of all this, the condemnation of all weakness. This is a particular idea in all our teachings which I like, either in philosophy or in religion or in work. If you read the Vedas, you will find this word always repeated, fearlessness, fear nothing, 
Fear is a sign of weakness. A man must go about his duties without taking notice of the sneers and the ridicule of the world. If a man retires from the world to worship God, he must not think that those who live in the world and work for the good of the world are not worshipping God. Neither must those who live in the world for wife and children think that those who give up the world are low vagabonds. Each is great in his own place. This thought I will illustrate by a story. A certain king used to inquire of all the sannyasins that came to his country, which is the greater man? He who gives up the world and becomes a sannyasin or he who lives in the world and performs his duties as a householder? Many wise men sought to solve the problem. Some asserted that the sannyasin was the greater, upon which the king demanded that they should prove their assertion. When they could not, he ordered them to marry and become householders. Then others came and said, The householder who performs his duties is the greater man. Of them, too, the king demanded proofs. When they could not give them, he made them also settle down as householders. At last, there came a young sannyasin, and the king similarly inquired of him also. He answered, each, O king, is equally great in his place. Prove this to me, asked the king. I will prove it to you, said the sannyasin. But you must first come and live as I do for a few days, that I may be able to prove to you what I say. The king consented and followed the sannyasin out of his own territory and passed through many other countries until they came to a great kingdom. In the capital of that kingdom, a great ceremony was going on. The king and the sannyasin heard the noise of drums and music and heard also the criers. The people were assembled in the streets in gala dress and a great proclamation was being made. The king and the sannyasin stood there to see what was going on. The crier was proclaiming loudly that the princess, daughter of the king of that country, was about to choose a husband from among those assembled before her. It was an old custom in India for princesses to choose husbands in this way. Each princess had certain ideas of the sort of man she wanted for a husband. Some would have the handsomest man, others would have only the most learned, others again the richest and so on. All the princes of the neighborhood put on their bravest attire and presented themselves before her. Sometimes they too had their own criers to enumerate their advantages and the reasons why they hoped the princess would choose them. The princess was taken round on a throne in the most splendid array and looked at and heard about them. If she was not pleased with what she saw and heard, she said to her bearers, move on and no more notice was taken of the rejected suitors. If, however, the princess was pleased with any one of them, she threw a garland of flowers over him and he became her husband. The princess of the country to which our king and the sannyasin had come was having one of these interesting ceremonies. She was the most beautiful princess in the world and the husband of the princess would be ruler of the kingdom after her father's death. The idea of this princess was to marry the handsomest man, but she could not find the right one to please her. Several times these meetings had taken place, but the princess could not select a husband. This meeting was the most splendid of all. More people had than ever had come to it. The princess came in on a throne and the bearers carried her from place to place. She did not seem to care for anyone and everyone became disappointed that this meeting also was going to be a failure. Just then came a young man, a sannyasin, handsome as if the sun had come down to the earth and stood in one corner of the assembly watching what was going on. The throne with the princess came near him and as soon as she saw the beautiful sannyasin, she stopped and threw the garland over him. The young sannyasin seized the garland and threw it off, exclaiming, what nonsense is this? I am a sannyasin. What is marriage to me? The king of that country thought that perhaps this man was poor and so dared not marry the princess and said to him, 
with my daughter goes half my kingdom now and the whole kingdom after my death and put the garland again on the sanyasin the young man threw it off once more saying nonsense i do not want to marry and walked quickly away from the assembly now the princess had fallen so much in love with this young man that she said i must marry this man or i shall die and she went after him to bring him back then her other sanyasin who had brought the king there said to him king let us follow this pair so they walked after them but at a good distance behind the young sanyasin who had refused to marry the princess walked out into the country for several miles when he came to a forest and entered into it the princess followed him and the other two followed them now this young sanyasin was well acquainted with that forest and knew all the intricate parts in it he suddenly passed into one of these and disappeared and the princess could not discover him after trying for a long time to find him she sat down under a tree and began to weep for she did not know the way out then her king and the other sanyasin came up to her and said do not weep we will show you the way out of this forest but it is too dark for us to find it now here is a big tree let us rest under it and in the morning we will go early and show you the road now a little bird and his wife and the three little ones lived on that tree in a nest this little bird looked down and saw the three people under the tree and said to his wife my dear what shall we do here are some guests in the house and it is winter and we have no fire so he flew away and got a bit of burning firewood in his beak and dropped it before the guests to which they added fuel and made a blazing fire but the little bird was not satisfied he said again to his wife my dear what shall we do there is nothing to give these people to eat and they are hungry we are householders it is our duty to feed anyone who comes to the house i must do what i can i will give them my body so he plunged into the midst of the fire and perished the guests saw him falling and tried to save him but he was too quick for them the little bird's wife saw what her husband did and she said here are three persons and only one little bird for them to eat it is not enough it is my duty as a wife not to let my husband's efforts go in vain let them have my body also then she fell into the fire and was burnt to death then the three baby birds when they saw what was done and that there was still not enough food for the three guests said our parents have done what they could and still it is not enough it is our duty to carry on the work of our parents let our bodies go too and they all dashed down into the fire also amazed at what they saw the three people could not of course eat these birds they passed the night without food and in the morning the king and the sanyasin showed the princess the way and she went back to her father then the sanyasin said to the king king you have seen that each is great in his own place if you want to live in the world live like those birds ready at any moment to sacrifice yourself for others if you want to renounce the world be like that young man to whom the most beautiful woman and a kingdom were as nothing if you want to be a householder hold your life a sacrifice for the welfare of others and if you choose the life of renunciation do not even look at beauty and money and power each is great in his own place but the duty of the one is not the duty of the other chapter 3 the secret of work helping others physically by removing the physical needs is indeed great but the help is great according as the need 
is greater and according as the help is far reaching if a man's wants can be removed for an hour it is helping him indeed if his wants can be removed for a year it will be more help to him but if his wants can be removed for ever it is surely the greatest help that can be given him spiritual knowledge is the only thing that can destroy our miseries for ever any other knowledge satisfies wants only for a time it is only with the knowledge of the spirit that the faculty of want is annihilated forever so helping man spiritually is the highest help that can be given to him he who gives man spiritual knowledge is the greatest benefactor of mankind and as such we always find that those were the most powerful of men who helped man in his spiritual needs because spirituality is a true basis of all our activities in life a spiritually strong and sound man will be strong in every other respect if he so wishes until there is spiritual strength in man even physical needs cannot be well satisfied next to spiritual comes intellectual help The gift of knowledge is a far higher gift than that of food and clothes. It is even higher than giving life to a man because the real life of man consists of knowledge. Ignorance is death. Knowledge is life. Life is of very little value if it is life in the dark, groping through ignorance and misery. Next in order comes of course helping a man physically. Therefore in considering the question of helping others we must always strive not to commit the mistake of thinking that physical help is the only help that can be given it is not only the last but the least because it cannot bring about permanent satisfaction the misery that i feel when i'm hungry is satisfied by eating but hunger returns my misery can cease only when i am satisfied beyond all want then hunger will not make me miserable no distress no sorrow will be able to move me so that help which tends to make us strong spiritually is the highest next to it comes intellectual help and after that physical help the miseries of the world cannot be cured by physical help only until man's nature changes these physical needs will always arise and miseries will always be felt and no amount of physical help will cure them completely the only solution of this problem is to make mankind pure ignorance is the mother of all the evil and all the misery we see let men have light let them be pure and spiritually strong and educated then alone will misery cease in the world not before we may convert every house in the country into a charity asylum we may fill the land with hospitals but the misery of man will still continue to exist until man's character changes we read in the bhagavad gita again and again that we must all work incessantly all work is by nature composed of good and evil we cannot do any work which will not do some good somewhere there cannot be any work which will not cause some harm somewhere every work must necessarily be a mixture of good and evil yet we are commanded to work incessantly good and evil will both have their results will produce their karma good action will entail upon us good effect bad action bad but good and bad are both bondages of the soul the solution reached in the gita in regard to this bondage producing nature of work is that if we do not attach ourselves to the work we do it will not have any binding effect on our soul we shall try to understand what is meant by this non attachment to work this is the one central idea in the gita work incessantly but be not attached to it samskara can be translated very nearly by inherent tendency using the simile of a lake for the mind every ripple every wave that rises in the mind when it subsides does not die out entirely but leaves a mark and a future possibility of that wave coming out again this mark with the possibility of the wave reappearing is what is called samskara every work that we do every movement of the body 
every thought that we think leaves such an impression on the mind stuff and even when such impressions are not obvious on the surface they are sufficiently strong to work beneath the surface subconsciously what we are every moment is determined by the sum total of these impressions on the mind what i am just at this moment is the effect of the sum total of all the impressions of my past life this is really what is meant by character each man's character is determined by the sum total of these impressions if good impressions prevail the character becomes good if bad it becomes bad if a man continuously hears bad words thinks bad thoughts does bad actions his mind will be full of bad impressions and they will influence his thought and work without his being conscious of the fact in fact these bad impressions are always working and their resultant must be evil and that man will be a bad man he cannot help it the sum total of these impressions in him will create the strong motive power for doing bad actions he will be like a machine in the hand of his impressions and they will force him to do evil similarly if a man thinks good thoughts and does good work the sum total of these impressions will be good and they in a similar manner will force him to do good even in spite of himself when a man has done so much good work and thought so many good thoughts that there is an irresistible tendency in him to do good in spite of himself and even if he wishes to do evil his mind as the sum total of his tendencies will not allow him to do so the tendencies will turn back he is completely under the influence of the good tendencies when such is the case a man's good character is said to be established as a tortoise tucks its feet and head inside the shell and you may kill it and break it in pieces and yet it will not come out even so the character of that man who has control over his motives and organs is unchangeably established he controls his own inner forces and nothing can draw them out against his will by this continuous reflex of good thoughts good impressions moving over the surface of the mind the tendency for doing good becomes strong and as a result we feel able to control the indriyas the sense organs the nerve centers thus alone will character be established then alone a man gets to truth such a man is safe forever he cannot do any evil you may place him in any company there will be no danger for him there is a still higher state than having this good tendency and that is a desire for liberation you must remember that freedom of the soul is the goal of all yogas and each one equally leads to the same result by work alone men may get to where buddha got largely by meditation or christ by prayer buddha was a working gyani christ was a bhakt but the same goal was reached by both of them the difficulty is here liberation means entire freedom freedom from the bondage of good as well as from the bondage of evil a golden chain is as much a chain as an iron one there is a thorn in my finger and i use another to take the first one out when i have taken it out i throw both of them aside i have no necessity for keeping the second thorn because both are thorns after all so the bad tendencies are to be counteracted by the good ones and the bad impressions on the mind should be removed by the fresh waves of good ones until all that is evil almost disappears or is subdued and held in control in a corner of the mind but after that the good tendencies have also to be conquered thus the attached becomes the unattached work but let not the action or the thought produce a deep impression on the mind let the ripples come and go let huge actions proceed from the muscles and the brain but let them not make any deep impression on the soul how can this be done we see that the impression of any action to which we attach ourselves remains i may meet 100 of persons during the day and among them meet also one whom i love but when i retire at night i may try to think of all the faces i saw 
but only that face comes before the mind the face which i met perhaps only for one minute and which i loved all the others have vanished my attachment to this particular person caused a deeper impression on my mind than all the other faces Physiologically the impressions have all been the same every one of the faces that i saw pictured itself on the retina and the brain took the pictures in and yet there was no similarity of effect upon the mind most of the faces perhaps were entirely new faces about which i had never thought before but that one face of which i got only a glimpse found associations inside Perhaps I had pictured him in my mind for years, knew hundreds of things about him, and this one new vision of him awakened hundreds of sleeping memories in my mind. And this one impression having been repeated perhaps a hundred times more than those of the different faces together will produce a great effect on the mind. Therefore, be unattached, let things work, let brain centers work. work incessantly but let not a ripple conquer the mind work as if you were a stranger in this land a sojourner work incessantly but do not bind yourselves bondage is terrible this world is not our habitation it is only one of the many stages through which we are passing remember that great saying of the sankhya the whole of nature is for the soul not the soul for nature The very reason of nature's existence is for the education of the soul. It has no other meaning. It is there because the soul must have knowledge and through knowledge free itself. If we remember this always, we shall never be attached to nature. We shall know that nature is a book in which we are to read and that when we have gained the required knowledge, the book is of no more value to us. Instead of that, However, we are identifying ourselves with nature. We are thinking that the soul is for nature, that the spirit is for the flesh, and as the common saying has it, we think that man lives to eat and not eats to live. We are continually making this mistake. We are regarding nature as ourselves and are becoming attached to it. And as soon as this attachment comes, there is the deep impression on the soul which binds us down and makes us work not from freedom but like slaves the whole gist of this teaching is that you should work like a master and not as a slave work incessantly but do not do slave's work do you not see how everybody works nobody can be altogether at rest 99% of mankind work like slaves and the result is misery it is all selfish work work through freedom work through love the word love is very difficult to understand love never comes until there is freedom there is no true love possible in the slave if you buy a slave and tie him down in chains and make him work for you he will work like a drudge but there will be no love in him So when we ourselves work for the things of the world as slaves there can be no love in us and our work is not true work This is true of work done for relatives and friends and is true of work done for our own selves Selfish work is slave's work and here is a test Every act of love brings happiness there is no act of love which does not bring peace and blessedness as its reaction real existence real knowledge and real love are eternally connected with one another the three in one where one of them is the others also must be they are the three aspects of the one without a second the existence knowledge bliss when that existence becomes relative we see it as the world that knowledge becomes in its turn modified into the knowledge of the things of the world and that bliss forms the foundation of all true love known to the heart of man therefore true love can never react so as to cause pain either to the lover or to the beloved suppose a man loves a woman he wishes to have her all to himself 
and feels extremely jealous about her every movement. He wants her to sit near him, to stand near him, and to eat and move at his bidding. He is a slave to her and wishes to have her as his slave. That is not love. It is a kind of morbid affection of the slave, insinuating itself as love. It cannot be love because it is painful. If she does not do what he wants, it brings him pain. With love, there is no painful reaction. Love only brings a reaction of bliss. If it does not, it is not love. It is mistaking something else for love. When you have succeeded in loving your husband, your wife, your children, the whole world, the universe, in such a manner that there is no reaction of pain or jealousy, no selfish feeling, then you are in a fit state to be unattached. Krishna says, Look at me, Arjuna. If I stop from work for one moment, the whole universe will die. I have nothing to gain from work. I am the one Lord. But why do I work? Because I love the world. God is unattached because He loves. That real love makes us unattached. Wherever there is attachment, the clinging to the things of the world, you must know that it is all physical attraction between sets or particles of matter. Something that attracts two bodies nearer and nearer all the time. And if they cannot get near enough, produces pain. But where there is real love, it does not rest on physical attachment at all. Such lovers may be a thousand miles away from one another, but their love will be all the same. It does not die and will never produce any painful reaction. To attain this unattachment is almost a life work. But as soon as we have reached this point, we have attained the goal of love and become free. The bondage of nature falls from us and we see nature as she is. She forges no more chains for us. We stand entirely free and take not the results of work into consideration. Who then cares for what the results may be? Do you ask anything from your children in return for what you have given them? It is your duty to work for them and there the matter ends. In whatever you do for a particular person, a city or a state, assume the same attitude towards it as you are towards your children. Expect nothing in return. If you can invariably take the position of a giver, in which everything given by you is a free offering to the world, without any thought of return, then will your work bring you no attachment. Attachment comes only where we expect a return. If working like slaves results in selfishness and attachment, working as master of our own mind gives rise to the bliss of non-attachment. We often talk of right and justice, but we find that in the world, right and justice are mere baby's talk. There are two things which guide the conduct of men, might and mercy. The exercise of might is invariably the exercise of selfishness. All men and women try to make the most of whatever power or advantage they have. Mercy is in heaven itself. To be good, we have all to be merciful. Even justice and right should stand on mercy. All thought of obtaining return for the work we do hinders our spiritual progress. Nay, in the end, it brings misery. There is another way in which this idea of mercy and selfless charity can be put into practice. That is, by looking upon work as worship, in case we believe in a personal God. Here we give up all the fruits of our work unto the Lord, and worshipping Him thus, we have no right to expect anything from mankind for the work we do. The Lord Himself works incessantly and is ever without attachment. Just as water cannot wet the lotus leaf, so work cannot bind the unselfish man by giving rise to attachment to results. The selfless unattached man may live in the very heart of a crowded and sinful city. He will not be touched by sin.
This idea of complete self-sacrifice is illustrated in the following story. After the battle of Kurukshetra, the five Pandava brothers performed a great sacrifice and made very large gifts to the poor. All people expressed amazement at the greatness and richness of the sacrifice and said that such a sacrifice the world had never seen before. But after the ceremony, there came a little mongoose, half of whose body was golden and the other half brown. and he began to roll on the floor of the sacrificial hall he said to those around you are all liars this is no sacrifice what they exclaimed you say this is no sacrifice do you not know how money and jewels were poured out to the poor and everyone became rich and happy this was the most wonderful sacrifice any man ever performed but the goose said there was once a little village and in it there dwelt a poor brahman with his wife his son and his son's wife they were very poor and lived on small gifts made to them for preaching and teaching there came in that land a three years famine and the poor brahman suffered more than ever at last when the family had starved for days the father brought home one morning a little barley flour which he had been fortunate enough to obtain and he divided it into four parts one for each member of the family they prepared it for the meal and just as they were about to eat there was knock at the door the father opened it and there stood a guest now in india a guest is a sacred person he is as a god for the time being and must be treated as such so the poor brahman said come in sir you are welcome He set before the guest his own portion of the food which the guest quickly ate and said Oh sir you have killed me I have been starving for 10 days and this little bit has but increased my hunger Then the wife said to her husband Give him my share but the husband said not so The wife however insisted saying Here is a poor man and it is our duty as householders to see that he is fed and it is my duty as a wife to give him my portion seeing that you have no more to offer him then she gave a share to the guest which he ate and said he was still burning with hunger so the son said take my portion also it is the duty of a son to help his father to fulfill his obligation The guest ate that but remained still unsatisfied so the son's wife gave him her portion also that was sufficient and the guest departed blessing them that night those four people died of starvation a few granules of that flour had fallen on the floor and when i rolled my body on them half of it became golden as you see Since then I have been traveling all over the world hoping to find another sacrifice like that but nowhere have I found one nowhere else has the other half of my body been turned into gold that is why I say this is no sacrifice the idea of charity is going out of india great men are becoming fewer and fewer When I was first learning English I read an English story book in which there was a story about a dutiful boy who had gone out to work and had given some of his money to his old mother and this was praised in 3 or 4 pages What was that No Hindu boy can ever understand the moral of that story Now I understand it when I hear the western idea every man for himself and some men take everything for themselves and fathers and mothers and wives and children go to the wall that should never and no way be the ideal of the householder now you see what karma yoga means even at the point of death to help anyone without asking questions be cheated millions of times and never ask a question and never think of what you are doing Never want of your gifts to the poor or expect their gratitude 
but rather be grateful to them for giving you the occasion of practicing charity to them. Thus, it is plain that to be an ideal householder is a much more difficult task than to be an ideal sannyasin. The true life of work is indeed as hard as, if not harder, than the equally true life of renunciation. Chapter 4 what is duty? It is necessary in the study of karma yoga to know what duty is. If I had to do something, I must first know that it is my duty and then I can do it. The idea of duty again is different in different nations. The Mohammedan says what is written in his book, the Quran, is his duty. The Hindu says what is in the Vedas is his duty. And the Christian says what is in the Bible is his duty. We find that there are varied ideas of duty differing according to different states in life, different historical periods and different nations. The term duty, like every other universal abstract term, is impossible clearly to define. We can only get an idea of it by knowing its practical operations and results. When certain things occur before us, we have all a natural or trained impulse to act in a certain manner towards them. When this impulse comes, the mind begins to think about the situation. Sometimes it thinks that it is good to act in a particular manner under the given conditions. At other times it thinks that it is wrong to act in the same manner even in the very same circumstances. The ordinary idea of duty everywhere is that every good man follows the dictates of his conscience. But what is it that makes an act a duty? If a Christian finds a piece of beef before him and does not eat it to save his own life or will not give it to save the life of another man, he is sure to feel that he has not done his duty. But if a Hindu dares to eat that piece of beef, or to give it to another Hindu, he is equally sure to feel that he too has not done his duty. The Hindu's training and education make him feel that way. In the last century, there were notorious bands of robbers in India called thugs. They thought it their duty to kill any man they could and take away his money. The larger the number of men they killed, the better they thought they were. Ordinarily, if a man goes out into the street and shoots down another man, he is apt to feel sorry for it, thinking that he has done wrong. But if the same very man, as a soldier in his regiment, kills not one but twenty, he is certain to feel glad and think that he has done his duty remarkable well. Therefore we see that it is not the thing done that defines a duty. To give an objective definition of duty is thus entirely impossible. Yet there is duty from the subjective side. Any action that makes us go Godward is a good action and is our duty. Any action that makes us go downward is evil and is not our duty. From the subjective standpoint, we may see that certain acts have a tendency to exalt and ennoble us while certain other acts have a tendency to degrade and to brutalize us. But it is not possible to make out with certainty which acts have which kind of tendency in relation to all persons of all sorts and conditions. There is, however, only one idea of duty which has been universally accepted by all mankind, of all ages and sects and countries, and that has been summed up in a Sanskrit aphorism thus, Do not injure any being. Not injuring any being is virtue. Injuring any being is sin. The Bhagavad Gita frequently alludes to duties dependent upon birth and position in life. Birth and position in life and in society largely determine the mental and moral attitude of individuals towards the various activities of life. It is therefore our duty to do that work which will exalt and ennoble us in accordance with the ideals and activities of the society 
in which we are born but it must be particularly remembered that the same ideals and activities do not prevail in all societies and countries our ignorance of this is the main cause of much of the hatred of one nation towards another an american thinks that whatever an american does in accordance with the custom of his country is the best thing to do and that whoever does not follow his custom must be a very wicked man a hindu thinks that his customs are the only right ones and are the best in the world and that whosoever does not obey them must be the most wicked man living this is quite a natural mistake which all of us are apt to make but it is very harmful it is the cause of half the uncharitableness found in the world when i came to this country and was going through the chicago fair a man from behind pulled at my turban i looked back and saw that he was a very gentlemanly looking man neatly dressed i spoke to him and when he found that i knew english he became very much abashed on another occasion in the same fair another man gave me a push when i asked him the reason he also was ashamed and stammered out an apology saying why do you dress that way the sympathies of these men were limited within the range of their own language and their own fashion of dress much of the oppression of powerful nations on weaker ones is caused by this prejudice it dries up their fellow feeling for fellow men that very man who asked me why i did not dress as he did and wanted to ill treat me because of my dress may have been a very good man a good father and a good citizen but the kindliness of his nature died out as soon as he saw a man in a different dress strangers are exploited in all countries because they do not know how to defend themselves thus they carry home false impressions of the people they have seen sailors soldiers and traders behave in foreign lands in very queer ways although they would not dream of doing so in their own country perhaps this is why the chinese call europeans and americans foreign devils they could not have done this if they had met the good the kindly sides of western life therefore the one point we ought to remember is that we should always try to see the duty of others through their own eyes and never judge the customs of other people by our own standard i am not the standard of the universe i have to accommodate myself to the world and not the world to me so we see that environments change the nature of our duties and doing the duty which is ours at any particular time is the best thing we can do in this world let us do the duty which is ours by birth and when we have done that let us do the duty which is ours by our position in life and in society there is however one great danger in human nature which is that man never examines himself he thinks he is quite as fit to be on the throne as the king even if he is he must first show that he has done the duty of his own position and then higher duties will come to him when we begin to work earnestly in the world nature gives us blows right and left and soon enables us to find out our position no man can long occupy satisfactorily a position for which he is not fit there is no use in grumbling against nature's adjustment he who does the lower work is not therefore a lower man no man is to be judged by the mere nature of his duties but all should be judged by the manner and the spirit in which they perform them later on we shall find that even this idea of duty undergoes change and that the greatest work is done only when there is no selfish motive to prompt it yet it is work through the sense of duty that leads us to work without any idea of duty when work will become worship nay something higher then will work be done for its own sake we shall find that the philosophy of duty whether it is be in the form of ethics or of love is the same as in every other yoga the object being the attuning of the lower self so that the higher self may shine forth the listening of the frittering away of energies on the lower plane of existence 
so that the soul may manifest itself on the higher ones. This is accomplished by the continuous denial of low desires, which duty rigorously requires. The whole organization of society has thus been developed consciously or unconsciously in the realms of action and experience where by limiting selfishness we open the way to an unlimited expansion of the real nature of man. Duty is seldom sweet. It is only when love greases its wheels that it runs smoothly. It is a continuous friction otherwise. How else could parents do their duties to their children, husbands to their wives and vice versa? Do we not meet with cases of friction every day in our lives? Duty is sweet only through love and love shines in freedom alone. Yet, is it freedom to be a slave to the senses, to anger, to jealousies and a hundred other petty things that must occur every day in human life? In all these little roughnesses that we meet within life, the highest expression of freedom is to forbear. Women, slaves to their own irritable, jealous tempers, are apt to blame their husbands and assert their own freedom, as they think, not knowing that thereby they only prove that they are slaves. So it is with husbands who eternally find fault with their wives. Chastity is the first virtue in man or women, and the man who, however he may have strayed away, cannot be brought to the right path by a gentle and loving and chaste wife is indeed very rare. The world is not yet as bad as that. We hear much about brutal husbands all over the world and about the impurity of man. But is it not true that there are quite as many brutal and impure women as men? If all women were as good and pure as their own constant assertions would lead one to believe, I am perfectly satisfied that there would not be one impure man in the world. What brutality is there which purity and chastity cannot conquer? A good, chaste wife who thinks of every other man except her own husband as her child and has the attitude of a mother towards all men will grow so great in the power of her purity that there cannot be a single man, however brutal, who will not breathe an atmosphere of holiness in her presence. Similarly, Every husband must look upon all women, except his own wife, in the light of his own mother or daughter or sister. That man, again, who wants to be a teacher of religion, must look upon every woman as his mother and always behave towards her as such. The position of the mother is the highest in the world, as it is the one place in which to learn and exercise the greatest unselfishness. The love of God is the only love that is higher than a mother's love. All others are lower. It is the duty of the mother to think of her children first and then of herself. But instead of that, if the parents are always thinking of themselves first, the result is that the relation between parents and children becomes the same as that between birds and their offspring, which as soon as they are fledged, do not recognize any parents. Blessed indeed is the man who is able to look upon woman as the representative of the motherhood of God. Blessed indeed is the woman to whom man represents the fatherhood of God. Blessed are the children who look upon their parents as divinity manifested on earth. The only way to rise is by doing the duty next to us and thus gathering strength go on until we reach the highest state. A young sannyasin went to a forest, there he meditated, worshipped and practiced yoga for a long time. After years of hard work and practice, he was one day sitting under a tree when some dry leaves fell upon his head. He looked up and saw a crow and a crane fighting on the top of the tree, which made him very angry. He said, What? Dare you throw these dry leaves upon my head? As with these words, he angrily glanced at them. A flash of fire went out of his head, such was the yogi's power, and burnt the birds to ashes. He was very glad, almost overjoyed at his development of power. He could burn the crow and the crane by a look. After a time, he had 
to go to the town to beg his bread. He went, stood at the door and said, Mother, give me food. A voice came from inside the house. Wait a little, my son. The young man thought, You wretched woman, how dare you make me wait? You do not know my power yet. While he was thinking, thus the voice came again. Boy, don't be thinking too much of yourself. Here is neither crow nor crane. He was astonished. Still, he had to wait. At last the woman came and he fell at her feet and said, Mother, how did you know that? She said, My boy, I do not know your yoga or your practices. I am a common everyday woman. I made you wait because my husband is ill and I was nursing him. All my life I have struggled to do my duty. When I was unmarried, I did my duty to my parents. Now that I am married, I do my duty to my husband. That is all the yoga I practice. But by doing my duty, I have become illumined. Thus I could read your thoughts and know what you had done in the forest. If you want to know something higher than this, go to the market of such and such town where you will find a Vyadha who will tell you something that you will be very glad to learn. This Sinyasin thought, Why should I go to that town and to a Vyadha? But after what he had seen, his mind opened a little, so he went. When he came near the town, he found the market and there saw at a distance a big fat Vyadha cutting meat with big knives, talking and bargaining with different people. The young man said, Lord, help me. Is this the man from whom I am going to learn? He is the incarnation of a demon, if he is anything. In the meantime, this man looked up and said, Oh Swami, did that lady send you here? Take a seat until I have done my business. The Sanyasin thought, What comes to me here? He took his seat, the man went on with his work and after he had finished, he took his money and said to the Sanyasin, Come sir, come to my home. On reaching home, the Vyadha gave him a seat saying, Wait here and went into the house. He then washed his old father and mother, fed them and did all he could to please them. After which he came to the sannyasin and said, Now, sir, you have come here to see me. What can I do for you? The sannyasin asked him a few questions about soul and about God and the Vyadha gave him a lecture which forms a part of the Mahabharat called the Vyadha Gita. It contains one of the highest flights of the Vedanta. When the Vyadha finished his teaching, the sannyasin felt astonished. He said, why are you in that body? With such knowledge as yours, why are you in a Vyadha's body and doing such filthy, ugly work? My son, replied the Vyadha, no duty is ugly, no duty is impure. My birth placed me in these circumstances and environments. In my boyhood, I learned the trade, I am unattached and I try to do my duty well. I try to do my duty as a householder and I try to do all I can to make my father and mother happy. I neither know your yoga nor have I become a sannyasin, nor did I go out of the world into a forest. Nevertheless, all that you have heard and seen has come to me through the unattached doing of the duty which belongs to my position. There is a sage in India a great yogi, one of the most wonderful men I have ever seen in my life. He is a peculiar man. He will not teach anyone. If you ask him a question, he will not answer. It is too much for him to take up the position of a teacher. He will not do it. If you ask a question and wait for some days, in the course of conversation, he will bring up the subject and wonderful light will he throw on it. He told me once the secret of work. Let the end and the means be joined into one. When you are doing any work, do not think of anything beyond. Do it as worship, as the highest worship and devote your whole life to it for the time being. Thus, in the story, 
the vyadha and the woman did their duty with cheerfulness and wholeheartedness and the result was that they became illuminated clearly showing that the right performance of the duties of any station in life without attachment to results leads us to the highest realization of the perfection of the soul it is the worker who is attached to results that grumbles about the nature of the duty which has fallen to his lot to the unattached worker all duties are equally good and form efficient instruments with which selfishness and sensuality may be killed and the freedom of the soul secured we are all apt to think too highly of ourselves our duties are determined by our deserts to a much larger extent that we are willing to grant competition rouses envy and it kills the kindliness of the heart to the grumbler all duties are distasteful nothing will ever satisfy him and his whole life is doomed to prove a failure let us work on doing as we go whatever happens to be our duty and being ever ready to put our shoulders to the wheel then surely shall we see the light chapter 5 we help ourselves not the world before considering further how devotion to duty helps us in our spiritual progress let me place before you in a brief compass another aspect of what we in india mean by karma In every religion there are three parts philosophy mythology and ritual philosophy of course is the essence of every religion mythology explains and illustrates it by means of the more or less legendary lives of great men stories and fables of wonderful things and so on ritual gives to that philosophy a still more concrete form so that everyone may grasp it ritual is in fact concretized philosophy This ritual is karma. It is necessary in every religion because most of us cannot understand abstract spiritual things until we grow much spiritually. It is easy for men to think that they can understand anything, but when it comes to practical experience, they find that abstract ideas are often very hard to comprehend. Therefore, symbols are of great help. and we cannot dispense with the symbolical method of putting things before us from time immemorial symbols have been used by all kinds of religions in one sense we cannot think but in symbols words themselves are symbols of thought in another sense everything in the universe may be looked upon as a symbol the whole universe is a symbol and god is the essence behind This kind of symbology is not simply the creation of man. It is not that certain people belonging to a religion sit down together and think out certain symbols and bring them into existence out of their own minds. The symbols of religion have a natural growth. Otherwise, why is it that certain symbols are associated with certain ideas in the mind of almost everyone? Certain symbols are universally prevalent. Many of you may think that the cross first came into existence as a symbol in connection with the Christian religion, but as a matter of fact, it existed before Christianity was, before Moses was born, before the Vedas were given out, before there was any human record of human things. The cross may be found to have been in existence among the Aztecs and the Phoenicians. Every race seems to have had the cross. Again. The symbol of the crucified savior of a man crucified upon a cross appears to have been known to almost every nation. The circle has been a great symbol throughout the world. Then there is the most universal of all symbols, the swastika. At one time it was thought that the Buddhists carried it all over the world with them, but it has been found out that ages before Buddhism it was used among nations. in old babylon and in egypt it was to be found what does this show all these symbols could not have been purely conventional there must be some reason for them some natural association between them and the human mind language is not the result of convention it is not that people ever agreed to represent certain ideas by certain words there never was an idea without a corresponding word or a word without a corresponding idea 
Ideas and words are in their nature inseparable. The symbols to represent ideas may be sound symbols or color symbols. Deaf and dumb people have to think with other than sound symbols. Every thought in the mind has a form as its counterpart. This is called in Sanskrit philosophy Nama Rupa, name and form. It is as impossible to create by convention a system of symbols as it is to create a language. In the world's ritualistic symbols, we have an expression of the religious thought of humanity. It is easy to say that there is no use of rituals and temples and all such paraphernalia. Every baby says that in modern times. But it must be easy for all to see that those who worship inside a temple are in many respects different from those who will not worship there. Therefore, the association of particular temples, rituals and other concrete forms with particular religions has a tendency to bring into the minds of the followers of those religions the thoughts for which those concrete things stand as symbols. And it is not wise to ignore rituals and symbology altogether. The study and practice of these things form naturally a part of Karma Yoga. There are many other aspects of this science of work. One among them is to know the relation between thought and word and what can be achieved by the power of the word. In every religion, the power of the word is recognized, so much so that in some of them, creation itself is said to have come out of the word. The external aspect of the thought of God is the word, and as God thought and willed before he created, creation came out of the word. In the stress and hurry of our materialistic life, our nerves lose sensibility and become hardened. The older we grow, the longer we are knocked about in the world, the more callous we become, and we are apt to neglect things that even happen persistently and prominently around us. Human nature, however, asserts itself sometimes, and we are led to inquire into and wonder at some of these common occurrences. Wondering thus is the first step in the acquisition of light. Apart from the higher philosophic and religious value of the word, we may see that sound symbols play a prominent part in the drama of human life. I am talking to you. I am not touching you. The pulsations of the air caused by my speaking go into your ear. They touch your nerves and produce effects in your minds. You cannot resist this. What can be more wonderful than this? One man calls another a fool and at this the other stands up and clenches his fist and lands a blow on his nose. Look at the power of the word. There is a woman weeping and miserable. Another woman comes along and speaks to her a few gentle words. The doubled up frame of the weeping woman becomes straightened at once. Her sorrow is gone and she already begins to smile. Think of the power of words. They are a great force in higher philosophy as well as in common life. Day and night we manipulate this force without thought and without inquiry. To know the nature of this force and to use it well is also a part of Karma Yoga. Our duty to others means helping others, doing good to the world. Why should we do good to the world? Apparently to help the world, but really to help ourselves. We should always try to help the world. That should be the highest motive in us. But if we consider well, we find that the world does not require our help at all. This world was not made that you or I should come and help it. I once read a sermon in which it was said, All this beautiful world is very good because it gives us time and opportunity to help others. Apparently, this is a very beautiful sentiment. But is it not a blasphemy to say that the world needs our help? We cannot deny that there is much misery in it. To go out and help others is therefore the best thing we can do. Although in the long run, we shall find that helping others is only helping ourselves. As a boy, I had some white mice. They were kept in a little box in which there were little wheels. And when the mice tried to cross the wheels, the wheels turned and turned and the mice never got anywhere. So it is with the world and our helping it. The only help is that we get moral exercise. This world is neither good nor evil. Each man manufactures a world for himself. 
If a blind man begins to think of the world, it is either as soft or hard or as cold or hot. We are a mass of happiness or misery. We have seen that hundreds of times in our lives. As a rule, the young are optimistic and the old pessimistic. The young have life before them. The old complain their day is gone. Hundreds of desires which they cannot fulfill struggle in their hearts. Both are foolish nevertheless. Life is good or evil according to the state of mind in which we look at it. It is neither by itself. Fire by itself is neither good nor evil. When it keeps us warm, we say, how beautiful is fire. When it burns our fingers, we blame it. Still, in itself, it is neither good nor bad. According as we use it, it produces in us the feeling of good or bad. So also is this world. It is perfect. By perfection is meant that it is perfectly fitted to meet its ends. We may all be perfectly sure that it will go on beautifully well without us and we need not bother our heads wishing to help it. Yet, we must do good. The desire to do good is the highest motive power we have. If we know all the time that it is a privilege to help others, do not stand on a high pedestal and take five cents in your hand and say, Yeah, my poor man. But be grateful that the poor man is there so that by making a gift to him, you are able to help yourself. It is not the receiver that is blessed, but it is the giver. Be thankful that you are allowed to exercise your power of benevolence and mercy in the world and thus become pure and perfect. All good acts tend to make us pure and perfect. What can we do at best? Build a hospital, make roads or erect charity asylums. We may organize a charity and collect two or three millions of dollars. Build a hospital with one million, with the second give balls and drink champagne and of the third let the officers steal half and leave the rest finally to reach the poor. But what are all these? One mighty wind in five minutes can break all your buildings up. What shall we do then? One volcanic eruption may sweep away all our roads and hospitals and cities and buildings. Let us give up all this foolish talk of doing good to the world. It is not wanting for your help or my help. Yet we must work and constantly do good because it is a blessing to ourselves. That is the only way we can become perfect. No beggar whom we have helped has ever owed a single cent to us. We owe everything to him because he has allowed us to exercise our charity on him. It is entirely wrong to think that we have done or can do good to the world or to think that we have helped such and such people. It is a foolish thought and all foolish thoughts bring misery. We think that we have helped some man and expect him to thank us. And because he does not, unhappiness comes to us. Why should we expect anything in return for what we do? Be grateful to the man you help. Think of him as God. Is it not a great privilege to be allowed to worship God by helping our fellow men? If we were really unattached, we should escape all this pain of vain expectation and could cheerfully do good work in the world. Never will unhappiness or misery come through work done without attachment. The world will go on with its happiness and misery through eternity. There was a poor man who wanted some money. And somehow he had heard that if he could get hold of a ghost, he might command him to bring money or anything else he liked. So he was very anxious to get hold of a ghost. He went about searching for a man who would give him a ghost. And at last he found a sage with great powers and besought his help. The sage asked him what he would do with a ghost. I want a ghost to work for me. Teach me how to get hold of one, sir. I desire it very much, replied the man. But the sage said, Don't disturb yourself. Go home. The next day the man went again to the sage and began to weep and pray. Give me a ghost. I must have a ghost, sir, to help me. At last the sage was disgusted and said, Take this charm, repeat this magic word and a ghost will come. And whatever you say to him, he will do. But beware, they are terrible things and must be kept continually busy. 
If you fail to give him work, he will take your life. The man replied, That is easy. I can give him work for all his life. Then he went to a forest and after long repetition of the magic word, a huge ghost appeared before him and said, I am a ghost. I have been conquered by your magic, but you must keep me constantly employed. The moment you fail to give me work, I will kill you. The man said, Build me a palace. And the ghost said, It is done. The palace is built. Bring me money, said the man. Here is your money, said the ghost. Cut this forest down and build a city in its place. That is done, said the ghost. Anything more? Now the man began to be frightened and thought he could give him nothing more to do. He did everything in a trice. The ghost said, Give me something to do or I will eat you up. The poor man could find no further occupation for him and was frightened. So he ran and ran and at last reached the sage and said, Oh sir, protect my life. The sage asked him what the matter was and the man replied, I have nothing to give the ghost to do. Everything I tell him to do, he does in a moment and he threatens to eat me up if I don't give him work. Just then the ghost arrived saying, I'll eat you up and he would have swallowed the man. The man began to shake and beg the sage to save his life. The sage said, I will find you a way out. Look at the dog with the curly tail. Draw your sword quickly and cut the tail off and give it to the ghost to straighten it. The man cut off the dog's tail and gave it to the ghost saying, Straighten that out for me. The ghost took it and slowly and carefully straightened it out. But as soon as it, he let it go, it instantly curled up again. Once more, he laboriously straightened it out, only to find it again curled up as soon as he attempted to let go of it. Again, he patiently straightened it out. But as soon as he let it go, it curled up again. So he went on for days and days until he was exhausted and said, I was never in such trouble before in my life. I am an old veteran ghost, but never before was I in such trouble. I will make a compromise with you, he said to the man. You let me off and I will let you keep all I have given you and will promise not to harm you. The man was much pleased and accepted the offer gladly. This world is like a dog's curly tail and people have been striving to straighten it out for hundreds of years. But when they let it go, it has curled up again. How could it be otherwise? One must first know how to work without attachment. Then one will not be a fanatic. When we know that this world is like a dog's curly tail and will never get straightened, we shall not become fanatics. If there was no fanatism in the world, it would make much more progress than it does now. It is a mistake to think that fanatism can make for the progress of mankind. On the contrary, it is a retarding element creating hatred and anger and causing people to fight each other and making them unsympathetic. We think that whatever we do or possess is the best in the world and what we do not do or possess is of no value. So always remember the instance of the curly tail of the dog whenever you have a tendency to become a fanatic. Need not worry or make yourself sleepless about the world. It will go on without you. When you have avoided fanaticism, then alone will you work well. It is the level-headed man, the calm man of good judgment and cool nerves of great sympathy and love who does good work and so does good to himself. The fanatic is foolish and has no sympathy. He can never straighten the world nor himself become pure and perfect. To recapitulate the chief points in today's lecture, first, we have to bear in mind that we are all debtors to the world and the world does not owe us anything. It is a great privilege for all of us to be allowed to do anything for the world. In helping the world, we really help ourselves. The second point is that there is God in this universe. It is not true that this universe is drifting and stands in need of help from you and me. God is ever present therein. He is undying and eternally active and infinitely watchful. When the whole universe sleeps, 
he sleeps not he is working incessantly all the changes and manifestations of the world are his thirdly we ought not to hate anyone this world will always continue to be a mixture of good and evil our duty is to sympathize with the weak and to love even the wrong doer the world is a grand moral gymnasium wherein we have all to take exercise so as to become stronger and stronger spiritually fourthly we ought not to be fanatics of any kind because fanaticism is opposed to love you hear fanatics glibly saying i do not hate the sinner i hate the sin but i'm prepared to go any distance to see the face of that man who can really make a distinction between the sin and the sinner it is easy to say so if we can distinguish well between quality and substance we may become perfect men it is not easy to do this and further the calmer we are and the less disturbed our nerves the more shall we love and the better will our work be Chapter 6 Non-attachment is the complete self-abnegation. Just as every action that emanates from us comes back to us as reaction, even so our actions may act on other people and theirs on us. Perhaps all of you have observed it as a fact that when persons do evil actions, they become more and more evil, and when they begin to do good, they become stronger and stronger. and learn to do good at all times this intensification of the influence of action cannot be explained on any other ground than that we can act and react upon each other to take an illustration from physical science when i am doing a certain action my mind may be said to be in a certain state of vibration all minds which are in similar circumstances will have the tendency to be affected by my mind If there are different musical instruments tuned alike in one room all of you may have noticed that when one is struck the others have the tendency to vibrate so as to give the same note so all minds that have the same tension so to say will be equally affected by the same thought of course this influence of thought on mind will vary according to distance and other causes but the mind is always open to affection Suppose I am doing an evil act my mind is in a certain state of vibration and all minds in the universe which are in a similar state have the possibility of being affected by the vibration of my mind so when I am doing a good action my mind is in another state of vibration and all minds similarly strung have the possibility of being affected by my mind and this power of mind upon mind is more or less according as the force of the tension is greater or less following this simile further it is quite possible that just as light waves may travel for millions of years before they reach any object so thought waves may also travel hundreds of years before they meet an object with which they vibrate in unison it is quite possible therefore that this atmosphere of ours is full of such thought pulsations both good and evil every thought projected from every brain goes on pulsating as it were until it meets a fit object that will receive it any mind which is open to receive some of these impulses will take them immediately so when a man is doing evil actions he has brought his mind to a certain state of tension and all the waves which correspond to that state of tension and which may be said to be already in the atmosphere will struggle to enter into his mind that is why an evil doer generally goes on doing more and more evil his actions become intensified such also will be the case with the doer of good he will open himself to all the good waves that are in the atmosphere and his good actions also will become intensified we run therefore a twofold danger in doing evil First we open ourselves to all the evil influences surrounding us. Secondly, we create evil which affects others, maybe hundreds of years hence. In doing evil, we injure ourselves and others also. In doing good, we do good to ourselves and to others as well. 
and like all other forces in man these forces of good and evil also gather strength from outside according to karma yoga the action one has done cannot be destroyed until it has borne its fruit no power in nature can stop it from yielding its results if i do an evil action i must suffer for it there is no power in this universe to stop or stay it similarly if i do a good action there is no power in the universe which can stop its bearing good results the cause must have its effect nothing can prevent or restrain this now comes a very fine and serious question about karma yoga namely that these actions of ours both good and evil are intimately connected with each other we cannot put a line of demarcation and say this action is entirely good and this entirely evil there is no action which does not bear good and evil fruits at the same time to take the nearest example i am talking to you and some of you perhaps think i am doing good and at the same time i am perhaps killing thousands of microbes in the atmosphere i am thus doing evil to something else when it is very near to us and affects those we know we say that it is a very good action if it affects them in a good manner for instance you may call my speaking to you very good but the microbes will not the microbes you do not see but yourselves you do see the way in which my talk affects you is obvious to you but how it affects the microbes is not so obvious and so if we analyze our evil actions also we may find that some good possibly results from them somewhere he who in good action sees that there is something evil in it and in the midst of evil sees that there is something good in it somewhere has known the secret of work but what follows from it that howsoever we may try there cannot be any action which is perfectly pure or any which is perfectly impure taking purity and impurity in the sense of injury and non-injury we cannot breathe or live without injuring others and every bit of the food we eat is taken away from another's mouth our very lives are crowding each other's lives it may be men or animals or small microbes but someone or the other of these we have to crowd out that being the case it naturally follows that perfection can never be attained by work we may work through all eternity but there will be no way out of this intricate maze you may work on and on and on there will be no end to this inevitable association of good and evil in the results of work the second point to consider is what is the end of work we find the vast majority of people in every country believing that there will be a time when this world will become perfect when there will be no disease nor death nor unhappiness nor wickedness that is a very good idea a very good motive power to inspire and uplift the ignorant but if we think for a moment we shall find on the very face of it that it cannot be so how can it be seeing that good and evil are the observe and reverse of the same coin how can you have good without evil at the same time what is meant by perfection a perfect life is a contradiction in terms life itself is a state of continuous struggle between ourselves and everything outside every moment we are fighting actually with external nature and if we are defeated our life has to go it is for instance a continuous struggle for food and air if food or air fails we die life is not a simple and smoothly flowing thing but it is a compound effect this complex struggle between something inside and the external world is what we call life so it is clear that when this struggle ceases there will be an end of life what is meant by ideal happiness is the cessation of this struggle but then life will cease for the struggle can only cease when life itself has ceased we have seen already that in helping the world we help ourselves the main effect of work done for others is to purify ourselves by means of the constant effort to do good to others we are trying to forget ourselves this forgetfulness of self is the one great lesson we have to learn in life man thinks foolishly that he can make himself happy 
and after years of struggle finds out at last that true happiness consists in killing selfishness and that no one can make him happy except himself every act of charity every thought of sympathy every action of help every good deed is taking so much of self importance away from our little selves and making us think of ourselves as the lowest and the least and therefore it is all good here we find the gyan bhakti and karma all coming to one point the highest ideal is eternal an entire self abnegation where there is no i but all is thou and whether he is conscious or unconscious of it karma yoga leads man to that end a religious preacher may become horrified at the idea of an impersonal god he may insist on a personal god and wish to keep up his own identity and individuality whatever he may mean by that but his ideas of ethics if they are really good cannot but be based on the highest self abnegation it is the basis of all morality you may extend it to men or animals or angels it is the one basic idea the one fundamental principle running through all ethical systems you will find various classes of men in this world first there are the god men whose self abnegation is complete and who do only good to others even at the sacrifice of their own lives these are the highest of men if there are 100 of such in any country that country need never despair but they are unfortunately too few then there are the good men who do good to others so long as it does not injure themselves and there is a third class who do good to themselves injure others it is said by a sanskrit poet that there is a fourth unnameable class of people who injure others merely for injury's sake just as there are at one pole of existence the highest good men who do good for the sake of doing good so at the other pole there are others who injure others just for the sake of the injury they do not gain anything thereby but it is their nature to do evil here are two sanskrit words the one is pravritti which means revolving two words and the other is nivritti which means revolving away the revolving two words is what we call the world the i and mine it includes all those things which are always enriching that me by wealth and money and power and name and fame and which are of a grasping nature always tending to accumulate everything in one center that center being myself that is the pravritti the natural tendency of every human being taking everything from everywhere and heaping it around one center that center being man's own sweet self when this tendency begins to break when it is nivritti or going away from then begin morality and religion both pravritti and nivritti are of the nature of work the former is evil work and the latter is good work this nivritti is the fundamental basis of all morality and all religion and the very perfection of it is entire self abnegation readiness to sacrifice mind and body and everything for another being when a man has reached that state he has attained to the perfection of karma yoga this is the highest result of good works although a man has not studied a single system of philosophy although he does not believe in any god and never has believed although he has not prayed even once in his whole life if the simple power of good actions has brought him to that state where he is ready to give up his life and all else for others he has arrived at the same point to which the religious man will come through his prayers and the philosopher through his knowledge and so you may find that the philosopher the worker and the devotee all meet at one point that one point being self abnegation however much the systems of philosophy and religion may differ all mankind stand in reverence and awe before the man who is ready to sacrifice himself for others here it is not at all any question of creed or doctrine even men who are very much opposed to all religious ideas when they see one of these acts of complete self sacrifice 
feel that they must revere it. Have you not seen even a, a most bigoted Christian when he reads Edwin Arnold's Light of Asia stand in reverence of Buddha who preached no God, preached nothing but self-sacrifice. The only thing is that the bigot does not know that his own end and aim in life is exactly the same as that of those from whom he differs. The worshipper by keeping constantly before him the idea of God and a surrounding of good comes to the same point at last and says, Thy will be done and keeps nothing to himself. That is self-abnegation. The philosopher with his knowledge sees that the seeming self is a delusion and easily gives it up. It is self-abnegation. So karma, bhakti and jnana all meet here and this is what is meant by all the great preachers of ancient times when they taught that God is not the world. There is one thing which is the world and another which is God. And this distinction is very true. What they mean by world is selfishness. Unselfishness is God. One may live on a throne in a golden palace and be perfectly unselfish. And then he is in God. Another may live in a hut and wear rags and have nothing in the world. Yet, if he is selfish, he is intensely merged in the world. To come back to one of our main points, we say that we cannot do good without at the same time doing some evil or do evil without doing some good. Knowing this, how can we work? There have therefore been sects in this world who have in an astoundingly preposterous way preached slow suicide as the only means to get out of the world because if a man lives, he has to kill poor little animals and plants or do injury to something or someone. So according to them, the only way out of this world is to die. The Jains have preached this doctrine as their highest ideal. This teaching seems to be very logical. But the true solution is found in the Gita. It is the theory of non-attachment. To be attached to nothing while doing our work of life. Know that you are separated entirely from the world. Though you are in the world and that whatever you may be doing in it, you are not doing that for your own sake. Any action that you do for yourself will bring its effect to bear upon you. If it is a good action, you will have to take the good effect and if bad, you will have to take the bad effect. But any action that is not done for your own sake, whatever it be, will have no effect on you. There is to be found a very expressive sentence in our scriptures embodying this idea. Even if he kill the whole universe, or be himself killed, he is neither the killer nor the killed, when he knows that he is not acting for himself at all. Therefore, Karma Yoga teaches, do not give up the world, live in the world, imbibe its influences as much as you can, but if it be for your own enjoyment's sake, work not at all. Enjoyment should not be the goal. First kill yourself and then take the whole world as yourself. As the old Christians used to say, the old man must die. This old man is the selfish idea that the whole world is made for our enjoyment. Foolish parents teach their children to pray, O oh Lord, thou hast created this sun for me and this moon for me. As if the Lord has had nothing else to do than to create everything for these babies. Do not teach your children such nonsense. Then again, there are people who are foolish in another way. They teach us that all these animals were created for us to kill and eat and that this universe is for the enjoyment of men. That is all foolishness. A tiger may say, Man was created for me and pray, O Lord, how wicked are these men who do not come and place themselves before me to be eaten. They are breaking your law. If the world is created for us, we are also created for the world. That this world is created for our enjoyment is the most wicked idea that holds us down. This world is not for our sake. Millions pass out of it every year. The world does not feel it. Millions of others are supplied in their place. Just as much as the world is for us, so we also are for the world. 
to work properly therefore you have first to give up the idea of attachment secondly do not mix in the fray hold yourself as a witness and go on working my master used to say look upon your children as a nurse does the nurse will take your baby and fondle it and play with it and behave towards it as gently as if it were her own child but soon as you give her a notice to quit she is ready to start off bag and baggage from the house everything in the shape of attachment is forgotten it will not give the ordinary nurse the least pang to leave your children and take up other children even so are you to be with all that you consider your own you are the nurse and if you believe in god believe that all these things which you consider yours are really his the greatest weakness often insinuates itself as the greatest good and strength it is a weakness to think that any one is dependent on me and that i can do good to another this belief is the mother of all our attachment and through this attachment comes all our pain we must inform our minds that no one in this universe depends upon us not one beggar depends on our charity not one soul on our kindness not one living thing on our help all are helped on by nature and will be so helped even though millions of us were not here the course of nature will not stop for such as you and me it is as already pointed out only a blessed privilege to you and to me that we are allowed in the way of helping others to educate ourselves this is a great lesson to learn in life and when we have learned it fully we shall never be unhappy we can go and mix without harm in society anywhere and everywhere you may have wives and husbands and regiments of servants and kingdoms to govern if only you act on the principle that the world is not for you and does not inevitably need you they can do you no harm this very year some of your friends may have died is the world waiting without going on for them to come again is its current stopped no it goes on so drive out of your mind the idea that you have to do something for the world the world does not require any help from you it is sheer nonsense on the part of any man to think that he is born to help the world it is simply pride it is selfishness insinuating itself in the form of virtue when you have trained your mind and your nerves to realize this idea of the world's non-dependence on you or anybody there will then be no reaction in the form of pain resulting from work when you give something to a man and expect nothing do not even expect the man to be grateful his ingratitude will not tell upon you because you never expected anything never thought you had any right to anything in the way of a return you gave him what he deserved his own karma got it for him your karma made you the carrier thereof why should you be proud of having given away something you are the porter that carried the money or other kind of gift and the world deserved it by its own karma where is then the reason for pride in you there is nothing very great in what you give to the world when you have acquired the feeling of non attachment there will then be neither good nor evil for you it is only selfishness that causes the difference between good and evil it is a very hard thing to understand but you will come to learn in time that nothing in the universe has power over you until you allow it to exercise such a power nothing has power over the self of man until the self becomes a fool and loses independence so by non attachment you overcome and deny the power of anything to act upon you it is very easy to say that nothing has the right to act upon you until you allow it to do so but what is the true sign of the man who really does not allow anything to work upon him who is neither happy nor unhappy when acted upon by the external world the sign is that good or ill fortune causes no change in his mind in all conditions he continues to remain the same there was a great sage in india called vyasa this vyasa is known as the author of the vedanta aphorisms and was a holy man 
His father had tried to become a very perfect man and had failed. His grandfather had also tried and failed. His great grandfather had similarly tried and failed. He himself did not succeed perfectly, but his son Shuka was born perfect. Vyasa taught his son wisdom and after teaching him the knowledge of truth himself, he sent him to the court of King Janaka. He was a great king and was called Janaka Videha. Videha means without a body. Although a king, he had entirely forgotten that he was a body. He felt that he was a spirit all the time. This boy Shuka was sent to be taught by him. The king knew that Vyasa's son was coming to him to learn wisdom, so he made certain arrangements beforehand. And when the boy presented himself at the gates of the palace, the guards took no notice of him whatsoever. They only gave him a seat and he sat there for three days and nights, nobody speaking to him, nobody asking him who he was or whence he was. He was the son of a very great sage. His father was honoured by the whole country and he himself was a most respectable person. Yet the low, vulgar guards at the palace would take no notice of him. After that, suddenly the ministers of the king and all the big officials came there and received him with the greatest honours. They conducted him in and showed him into splendid rooms, gave him the most fragrant baths and wonderful dresses. And for eight days they kept him there in all kinds of luxury. That solemnly serene face of Shukha did not change even to the smallest extent by the change in the treatment according to him. He was the same in the midst of this luxury as when waiting at the door. Then he was brought before the king. The king was on his throne, music was playing and dancing and other amusements were going on. The king then gave him a cup of milk, full to the brim, and asked him to do seven times round the hall without spilling even a drop. The boy took the cup and proceeded in the midst of the music and the attraction of the beautiful faces. As desired by the king, seven times did he go round and not a drop of the milk was spilt. The boy's mind could not be attracted by anything in the world unless he allowed it to affect him. And when he brought the cup to the king, the king said to him, What your father has taught you and what you have learned yourself, I can only repeat. You have known the truth. Go home. Thus the man that has practice controlled over himself cannot be acted upon by anything outside. There is no more slavery for him. His mind has become free. Such a man alone is fit to live well in the world. We generally find men holding two opinions regarding the world. Some are pessimists and say, how horrible this world is, how wicked. Some others are optimists and say, how beautiful this world is, how wonderful. To those who have not controlled their own minds, the world is either full of evil or at best a mixture of good and evil. This very world will become to us an optimistic world when we become masters of our own minds. Nothing will then work upon us as good or evil. We shall find everything to be in its proper place, to be harmonious. Some men who begin by saying that the world is a hell often end up saying that it is a heaven when they succeed in the practice of self-control. If we are genuine karma yogis and wish to train ourselves to that attainment of the state, wherever we may begin, we are sure to end in perfect self-abnegation. And as soon as this seeming self has gone, the whole world, which at first appears to us to be filled with evil, will appear to be heaven itself and full of blessedness. Its very atmosphere will be blessed, every human face there will be God. Such is the end and aim of Karma Yoga and such is its perfection in practical life. Our various Yogas do not conflict with each other. Each of them leads us to the same goal and makes us perfect. Only each has to be strenuously practiced. The whole secret is in practicing. First you have to hear, then think and then practice. This is true of every yoga. You have first to hear about it 
and understand what it is and many things which you do not understand will be made clear to you by constant hearing and thinking it is hard to understand everything at once the explanation of everything is after all in yourself no one was really taught by another each of us has to teach himself the external teacher offers only the suggestion which rouses the internal teacher to work to understand things then things will be made clearer to us by our own power of perception and thought and we shall realize them in our own souls and that realization will grow into the intense power of will first it is feeling then it becomes willing and out of that willing comes the tremendous force for work that will go through every vein and nerve and muscle until the whole mass of your body is changed into an instrument of the unselfish yoga of work and the desired result of perfect self abnegation and utter unselfishness is duly attained this attainment does not depend on any dogma or doctrine or belief whether one is a christian or jew or gentile it does not matter are you unselfish that is the question if you are you will be perfect without reading a single religious book without going into a single church or temple each one of our yogas is fitted to make man perfect even without the help of the others because they have all the same goal in view the yogas of work of wisdom and of devotion are all capable of serving as direct and independent means for the attainment of moksha fools alone say that work and philosophy are different not the learned the learned know that though apparently different from each other they at last lead to the same goal of human perfection chapter 7 freedom in addition to meaning work we have stated that psychologically the word karma also implies causation any work any action any thought that produces an effect is called a karma thus the law of karma means the law of causation of inevitable cause and sequence wheresoever there is a cause there an effect must be produced this necessity cannot be resisted and this law of karma according to our philosophy is true throughout the whole universe whatever we see or feel or do whatever action there is anywhere in the universe while being the effect of past work on the one hand becomes on the other a cause in its turn and produces its own effect it is necessary together with this to consider what is meant by the word law by law is meant the tendency of a series to repeat itself when we see one event followed by another or sometimes happening simultaneously with another we expect the sequence or coexistence to recur our old logicians and philosophers of the nyaya school call this law by the name of vyapti according to them all our ideas of law are due to association a series of phenomena becomes associated with things in our mind in a sort of invariable order so that whatever we perceive at any time is immediately referred to other facts in the mind any one idea or according to our psychology any one wave that is produced in the mind stuff chitta must always give rise to many similar waves this is the psychological idea of association and causation is only as aspect of this grand pervasive principle of association this pervasiveness of association is what is in sanskrit called vyapti in the external world the idea of law is the same as in the internal the expectation that a particular phenomenon will be followed by another and that the series will repeat itself really speaking therefore law does not exist in nature practically it is an error to say that gravitation exists in the earth or that there is any law existing objectively anywhere in nature law is the method the manner in which our mind grasps a series of phenomena it is all in the mind certain phenomena happening one after another or together and followed by the conviction of the regularity of their occurrence 
thus enabling our minds to grasp the method of the whole series, constitute what we call law. The next question for consideration is what we mean by law being universal. Our universe is that portion of existence which is characterized by what the Sanskrit psychologist called Desh Kala Nimitta or what is known to European psychology as space, time and causation. This universe is only a part of infinite existence, thrown into a particular mold composed of space, time and causation. It necessarily follows that law is possible only within this conditioned universe, beyond it there cannot be any law. When we speak of the universe, we only mean that portion of existence which is limited by our mind. The universe of the senses which we can see, feel, touch, hear, think of, imagine. This alone is under law, but beyond it existence cannot be subject to law because causation does not extend beyond the world of our minds. Anything beyond the range of our mind and our senses is not bound by the law of causation as there is no mental association of things in the region beyond the senses and no causation without association of ideas. It is only when being or existence gets molded into name and form that it obeys the law of causation and is said to be under law because all law has its essence in causation. Therefore, we see at once that there cannot be any such thing as free will. The very words are a contradiction because will is what we know and everything that we know is within our universe. And everything within our universe is molded by the conditions of space, time and causation. Everything that we know or can possibly know must be subject to causation and that which obeys the law of causation cannot be free. It is acted upon by other agents and becomes a cause in its turn. But that which has become converted into the will, which was not the will before, but which when it fell into this mold of space, time and causation, became converted into the human will, is free. And when this will gets out of this mold of space, time and causation, it will be free again. From freedom it comes and becomes molded into this bondage and it goes out and goes back to freedom again. The question has been raised as to from whom this universe comes, in whom it rests and to whom it goes. And the answer has been given that from freedom it comes, in bondage it rests and goes back into that freedom again. So when we speak of man as no other than that infinite being which is manifesting itself, we mean that only one very small part thereof is man. This body and this mind which we see are only one part of the whole, only one spot of the infinite being. This whole universe is only one speck of the infinite being and all our laws, our bondages, our joys and our sorrows, our happiness, our expectations are only within this small universe. All our progression and digression are within its small compass. So you see how childish it is to expect a continuation of this universe, the creation of our minds, and to expect to go to heaven which after all must mean only repetition of this world that we know. You see at once that it is an impossible and childish desire to make the whole of infinite existence conform to the limited and conditioned existence which we know. When a man says that he will have again and again the same thing which he is having now, or as I sometimes put it, when he asks for a comfortable religion, you may know that he has become so degenerate that he cannot think of anything higher than what he is now. He is just his little present surroundings and nothing more. He has forgotten his infinite nature and his whole idea is confined to these little joys and sorrows and heart jealousies of the moment. He thinks that this finite thing is the infinite and not only so, he will not let this foolishness go. He clings on desperately unto Trishna and the thirst after life, what the Buddhists call Tanha and Tissa. There may be millions of kinds of happiness and beings and laws and progress and causation 
all acting outside the little universe that we know. And after all, the whole of this comprises but one section of our infinite nature. To acquire freedom, we have to get beyond the limitations of this universe. It cannot be found here. Perfect equilibrium or what the Christians call the peace that passeth all understanding cannot be had in this universe, nor in heaven, nor in any place where our mind and thoughts can go, where the senses can feel or which the imagination can conceive. No such place can give us that freedom because all such places would be within our universe and it is limited by space, time and causation. There may be places that are more ethereal than this earth of ours, where enjoyments may be keener and even those places must be in the universe and therefore in bondage to law. So we have to go beyond and real religion begins where this little universe ends. These little joys and sorrows and knowledge of things and end there and the reality begins. Until we give up the thirst after life, the strong attachment to this, our transient conditioned existence, we have no hope of catching even a glimpse of that infinite freedom beyond. It stands to reason then that there is only one way to attain to that freedom which is the goal of all the noblest aspirations of mankind and that is by giving up this little life, giving up this little universe, giving up this earth, giving up heaven, giving up the body, giving up the mind, giving up everything that is limited and conditioned. If we give up our attachment to this little universe of the senses or of the mind, we shall be free immediately. The only way to come out of bondage is to go beyond the limitations of law, to go beyond causation. But it is the most difficult thing to give up the clinging to this universe. Few ever attain to that. There are two ways to do that mentioned in our books. One is called the Neti Neti, not this, not this. The other is called Iti, this. The former is the negative and the latter is the positive way. The negative way is the most difficult. It is only possible to the men of the very highest, exceptional minds and gigantic wills who simply stand up and say, No, I will not have this. And the mind and body obey their will and they come out successful. But such people are very rare. The vast majority of mankind choose the positive way, the way through the world, making use of all the bondages themselves to break those very bondages. This is also a kind of giving up, only it is done slowly and gradually by knowing things, enjoying things and thus obtaining experience and knowing the nature of things until the mind lets them all go at last and becomes unattached. The former way of obtaining non-attachment is by reasoning and the latter way is through work and experience. The first is the path of Gyan Yoga and is characterized by the refusal to do any work. The second is that of Karma Yoga in which there is no cessation from work. Every one must work in the universe. Only those who are perfectly satisfied with the self whose desires do not go beyond the self, whose mind never strays out of the self, to whom the self is all in all, only those do not work. The rest must work. A current rushing down of its own nature falls into a hollow and makes a whirlpool. And after running a little in that whirlpool, it emerges again in the form of the free current to go on unchecked. Each human life is like that current. It gets into the whirl, gets involved in this world of space, time and causation, whirls around a little, crying out, my father, my brother, my name, my fame, and so on, and at last emerges out of it and regains its original freedom. The whole universe is doing that. Whether we know it or not, whether we are conscious or unconscious of it, we are all working to get out of the dream of the world. Man's experience in the world is to enable him to get out of its whirlpool. What is Karma Yoga? The knowledge of the secret of work. We see that the whole universe is working. For what? For salvation, for liberty. From the atom to the highest being, working for the one end, liberty for the mind, for the body, for the spirit. All things are always trying to get freedom. 
flying away from bondage the sun the moon the earth the planets all are trying to fly away from bondage the centrifugal and the centripetal forces of nature are indeed typical of our universe instead of being knocked about in this universe and after long delay in thrashing getting to know things as they are we learn from karma yoga the secret of work the method of work the organizing power of work a vast mass of energy may be spent in vain if you do not know how to utilize it karma yoga makes a science of work you learn by it how best to utilize all the workings of this world work is inevitable it must be so but we should work to the highest purpose karma yoga makes us admit that this world is a world of 5 minutes that it is a something we have to pass through and that freedom is not here but is only to be found beyond to find the way out of the bondages of the world we have to go through it slowly and surely there may be those exceptional persons about whom i just spoke those who can stand aside and give up the world as a snake casts off its skin and stands aside and looks at it there are no doubt these exceptional beings but the rest of mankind have to go slowly through the world of work karma yoga shows the process the secret and the method of doing it to the best advantage what does it say work incessantly but give up all the attachment to work do not identify yourself with anything hold your mind free all this that you see the pains and the miseries are but the necessary conditions of this world poverty and wealth and happiness are but momentary they do not belong to our real nature at all our nature is far beyond misery and happiness beyond every object of the senses beyond the imagination and yet we must go on working all the time misery comes through attachment not through work as soon as we identify ourselves with the work we do we feel miserable but if we do not identify ourselves with it we do not feel that misery if a beautiful picture belonging to another is burnt a man does not generally become miserable but when his own picture is burnt how miserable he feels why both were beautiful pictures perhaps copies of the same original but in one case very much more misery is felt than in the other it is because in one case he identifies himself with the picture and not in the other this i and mine causes the whole misery with the sense of possession comes selfishness and selfishness brings on misery every act of selfishness or thought of selfishness makes us attached to something and immediately we are made slaves each wave in the chitta that says i and mine immediately puts a chain around us and makes us slaves and the more we say i and mine the more slavery grows the more misery increases therefore karma yoga tells us to enjoy the beauty of all the pictures in the world but not to identify ourselves with any of them never say mine whenever we say a thing is mine misery will immediately come do not even say my child in your mind possess the child but do not say mine if you do then will come the misery do not say my house do not say my body the whole difficulty is there the body is neither yours nor mine nor nobody's these bodies are coming and going by the laws of nature but we are free standing as witness this body is no more free than a picture or a wall why should we be attached so much to a body if somebody paints a picture he does it and passes on do not project that tentacle of selfishness i must possess it as soon as that is projected misery will begin so karma yoga says first destroy the tendency to project this tentacle of selfishness and when you have the power of checking it hold it in and do not allow the mind to get into the ways of selfishness then you may go out into the world and work as much as you can mix everywhere go where you please you will never be contaminated with evil there is the lotus leaf in the water the water cannot touch and adhere to it so will you be in the world this is called vairagya dispassion or non attachment 
I believe I have told you that without non-attachment, there cannot be any kind of yoga. Non-attachment is the basis of all the yogas. The man who gives up living in houses, wearing fine clothes, eating good food, and goes into the desert may be a most attached person. His only possession, his own body, may become everything to him. And as he lives, he will be simply struggling for the sake of this body. Non-attachment does not mean anything that we may do in relation to our external body. It is all in the mind. The binding link of I and mine is in the mind. If we have not this link with the body and with the things of the senses, we are non-attached, wherever and whatever we may be. A man may be on a throne and perfectly non-attached. Another man may be in rags and still very much attached. First, we have to attain the state of non-attachment and then to work incessantly. Karma Yoga gives us the method that will help us in giving up all attachment, though it is indeed very hard. Here are the two ways of giving up all attachment. The one is for those who do not believe in God or in any outside help. They are left to their own devices. They have simply to work with their own will, with the powers of their mind and discrimination, saying, I must be non-attached. For those who believe in God, there is another way, which is much less difficult. They give up the fruits of work unto the Lord. They work and are never attached to the results. Whatever they see, feel, hear or do is for Him. For whatever good work we may do, let us not claim any praise or benefit. It is the Lord's. Give up the fruits unto Him. Let us stand aside and think that we are only servants obeying the Lord, our Master, and that every impulse for action comes from Him every moment. Whatever thou worshipest, whatever thou perceivest, whatever thou doest, give up all unto Him and be at rest. Let us be at peace, perfect peace, with ourselves and give up our whole body and mind and everything as an eternal sacrifice unto the Lord. Instead of the sacrifice of pouring oblations into the fire, perform this one great sacrifice day and night, the sacrifice of your little self. In search of wealth in this world, thou art the only wealth I have found. I sacrifice myself unto thee. In search of someone to be loved, thou art the only one beloved I have found. I sacrifice myself unto thee. Let us repeat this day and night and say, Nothing for me, no matter whether the thing is good, bad or indifferent. I do not care for it. I sacrifice all unto thee. Day and night, let us renounce our seeming self until it becomes a habit with us to do so. Until it gets into the blood, the nerves and the brain. And the whole body is every moment obedient to this idea of self-renunciation. Go then into the midst of the battlefield with the roaring cannon and the din of war and you will find yourself to be free and at peace. Karma Yoga teaches us that the ordinary idea of duty is on the lower plane. Nevertheless, all of us have to do our duty. Yet we may see that this particular sense of duty is very often a great cause of misery. Duty becomes a disease with us. It drags us ever forward. It catches hold of us and makes our whole life miserable. It is the bane of human life. This duty, this idea of duty is the midday summer sun which scorches the innermost soul of mankind. Look at those poor slaves to duty. Duty leaves them no time to say prayers, no time to bathe. Duty is ever on them. They go out and work. Duty is on them. They come home and think of the work for the next day. Duty is on them. It is living a slave's life, at last dropping down in the street and dying in harness like a horse. This is duty as it is understood. The only true duty is to be unattached and go to work as free beings, to give up all work unto God. All our duties are His. Blessed are we that we are ordered out here. We serve our time, whether we do it ill or well, who knows? If we do it well, we do not get the fruits. If we do it ill, neither do we get the care. 
be at rest be free and work this kind of freedom is a very hard thing to attain how easy it is to interpret slavery as duty the morbid attachment of flesh for flesh as duty men go out into the world and struggle and fight for money or for any other thing to which they get attached ask them why they do it they say it is a duty it is the absurd greed for gold and gain and they try to cover it with a few flowers what is duty after all it is really the impulsion of the flesh of our attachment and when an attachment has become established we call it duty for instance in countries where there is no marriage there is no duty between husband and wife when marriage comes husband and wife live together on account of attachment and that kind of living together becomes settled after generations and when it becomes so settled it becomes a duty it is so to say a sort of chronic disease when it is acute we call it disease when it is chronic we call it nature it is a disease so when attachment becomes chronic we baptize it with the high sounding name of duty we strew flowers upon it trumpets sound for it sacred texts are said over it and then the whole world fights and men earnestly rob each other for this duty's sake duty is good to the extent that it checks brutality to the lowest kinds of men who cannot have any other ideal it is of some good but those who want to be karma yogis must throw this idea of duty overboard there is no duty for you and me whatever you have to give to the world do give by all means but not as a duty do not take any thought of that be not compelled why should you be compelled everything that you do under compulsion goes to build up attachment why should you have any duty resign everything unto god in this tremendous fiery furnace where the fire of duty scorches everybody drink this cup of nectar and be happy we are all simply working out his will and have nothing to do with rewards and punishments if you want the reward you must also have the punishment the only way to get out of the punishment is to give up the reward the only way of getting out of misery is by giving up the idea of happiness because these two are linked to each other on one side there is happiness and on the other there is misery on one side there is life on the other there is death the only way to get beyond death is to give up the love of life life and death are the same thing looked at from different points so the idea of happiness without misery or life without death is very good for school boys and children but the thinker sees that it is all a contradiction in terms and gives up both seek no praise no reward for anything you do no sooner do we perform a good action then we begin to desire credit for it no sooner do we give money to some charity than we want to see our names blazoned in the papers misery must come as a result of such desires the greatest men in the world have passed away unknown the buddhas and the christ that we know are but second rate heroes in comparison with the greatest men of whom the world knows nothing hundreds of these unknown heroes have lived in every country working silently silently they live and silently they pass away and in time the thoughts find expressions in buddhas or christ and it is these latter that became known to us the highest men do not seek to get any name or fame from their knowledge they leave their ideas to the world they put forth no claims for themselves and establish no schools or systems in their name their whole nature shrinks from such a thing they are the poor satvikas and can never make any stir but only melt down in love i have seen one such yogi who lives in a cave in india he is one of the most wonderful men i have ever seen he has so completely lost the sense of his own individuality that we may say that the man in him is completely gone leaving behind only the all comprehending sense of the divine if an animal bites one of his arms he is ready to give his other arm also and say that it is the lord's will everything that comes to him is from the lord he does not show himself to men and yet he is a magazine of love and of true and sweet ideas
Next in order come the men with more rajas or activity, combative natures, who take up the ideas of the perfect ones and preach them to the world. The highest kind of men silently collect true and noble ideas, and others, the Buddhas and Christs, go from place to place preaching them and working for them. In the life of Gautam Buddha, we notice him constantly saying that he is the 25th Buddha. The 24 before him are unknown to history, although the Buddha known to history must have built upon foundations laid by them. The highest men are calm, silent and unknown. They are the men who really know the power of thought. They are sure that even if they go into a cave and close the door and simply think five true thoughts and then pass away, these five thoughts of theirs will live through eternity. Indeed, such thoughts will penetrate through the mountains, cross the oceans and travel through the world. They will enter deep into human hearts and brains and raise up men and women who will give them practical expression in the workings of human life. These Satavika men are too near the world to be active and to fight, to be working, struggling, preaching and doing good, as they say, here on earth to humanity. The active workers, however, good have still a little remnant of ignorance left in them. When our nature has yet some impurities left in it, then alone can we work. It is in the nature of work to be impelled ordinarily by motive and by attachment. In the presence of an ever active providence who notes even the sparrows fall, how can man attach any importance to his own work? Will it not be a blasphemy to do so when we know that he is taking care of the minutest things in the world? We have only to stand in awe and reverence before him saying, Thy will be done. The highest men cannot work, for in them there is no attachment. Those whose whole soul is gone into the self, those whose desires are confined in the self, who have become ever associated with the self, for them there is no work. Such are indeed the highest of mankind, but apart from them everyone else has to work. In so working we should never think that we can help on even the least thing in this universe. We cannot. We only help ourselves in this gymnasium of the world. This is the proper attitude of work. If we work in this way, if we always remember that our present opportunity to work thus is a privilege which has been given to us, we shall never be attached to anything. Millions like you and me think that we are great people in the world. But we all die and in five minutes the world forgets us. But the life of God is infinite. Who can live a moment, breathe a moment, if this all-powerful one does not will it? He is the ever-active providence. All power is His and within His command. Through His command the wind blows, the sun shines, the earth lives and death stalks upon the earth. He is the all in all. He is all and in all. We can only worship Him. Give up all fruits of work, do good for its own sake. Then alone will come perfect non-attachment. The bonds of the heart will thus break and we shall reap perfect freedom. This freedom is indeed the goal of Karma Yoga. Chapter 8 The Ideal of Karma Yoga The grandest idea in the religion of the Vedanta is that we may reach the same goal by different paths. And these paths I have generalized into four, with those of work, love, psychology and knowledge. But you must at the same time remember that these divisions are not very marked and quite exclusive of each other. Each blends into the other, but according to the type which prevails, we name the divisions. It is not that you can find men who have no other faculty than that of work, nor that you can find men who are no more than devoted worshippers only, nor that there are men who have no more than mere knowledge. These divisions are made in accordance with the type or the tendency that may be seen to prevail in a man. We have found that in the end all these four paths converge and become one. All religions and all methods of work and worship lead us to one and the same goal. I have already tried to point out that goal. It is freedom as I understand it. 
Everything that we perceive around us is struggling towards freedom, from the atom to the man, from the insentient, lifeless particle of matter to the highest existence on earth, the human soul. The whole universe is in fact the result of this struggle for freedom. In all combinations, every particle is trying to go its own way, to fly from the other particles, but the others are holding it in check. Our earth is trying to fly away from the sun, the moon from the earth. Everything has a tendency to infinite dispersion. All that we see in the universe has for its basis this one struggle towards freedom. It is under the impulse of this tendency that the saint prays and the robber robs. When the line of action taken is not a proper one, we call it evil and when the manifestation of it is proper and high, we call it good. But the impulse is the same, the struggle towards freedom. The saint is oppressed with the knowledge of his condition of bondage and he wants to get rid of it, so he worships God. The thief is oppressed with the idea that he does not possess certain things and he tries to get rid of that want to obtain freedom from it. So he steals. Freedom is the one goal of all nature, sentient and or insentient, and consciously or unconsciously everything is struggling towards that goal. The freedom which the saint seeks is very different from that which the robber seeks. The freedom loved by the saint leads him to the enjoyment of infinite, unspeakable bliss while that on which the robber has set his heart only forges are the bonds for his soul. There is to be found in every religion the manifestation of this struggle towards freedom. It is the groundwork of all morality, of unselfishness, which means getting rid of the idea that men are the same as the little body. When we see a man doing good work, helping others, it means that he cannot be confined within the limited circle of me and mine. There is no limit in this getting out of selfishness. All the great systems of ethics preach absolute unselfishness as the goal. Supposing this absolute unselfishness can be reached by a man, what becomes of him? He is no more the little Mr. So and So. He has acquired infinite expansion. The little personality which he had before is now lost to him forever. He has become infinite. And the attainment of this infinite expansion is indeed the goal of all religions and of all moral and philosophical teachings. The personalist, when he hears this idea philosophically, put, gets frightened. At the same time, if he preaches morality, he after all teaches the very same idea himself. He puts no limit to the unselfishness of man. Suppose a man becomes perfectly unselfish under the personalistic system. How are we to distinguish him from the perfected ones in other systems? He has become one with the universe and to become that is the goal of all. Only the poor personalist has not the courage to follow out his own reasoning to its right conclusion. Karma Yoga is the attaining through unselfish work of that freedom which is the goal of all human nature. Every selfish action Therefore, retards are reaching the goal and every unselfish action takes us towards the goal. That is why the only definition that can be given of morality is this. That which is selfish is immoral and that which is unselfish is moral. But if you come to details, the matter will not be seen to be quite so simple. For instance, environment often makes the details different as I've already mentioned. The same action under one set of circumstances may be unselfish and under another set quite selfish. So we can give only a general definition and leave the details to be worked out by taking into consideration the differences in time, place and circumstances. In one country, one kind of conduct is considered moral and in another, the very same is immoral because the circumstances differ. The goal of all nature is freedom and freedom is to be attained only by perfect unselfishness. Every thought, word or deed that is unselfish takes us towards a goal and as such is called moral. 
that definition you will find holds good in every religion and every system of ethics in some systems of thought morality is derived from a superior being god if you ask why a man ought to do this and not that their answer is because such is the command of god but whatever be the source from which it is derived the code of ethics also has the same central idea not to think of self but to give up self and yet some persons in spite of this high ethical idea are frightened at the thought of having to give up their little personalities we may ask the man who clings to the idea of little personalities to consider the case of a person who has become perfectly unselfish who has no thought for himself who does no deed for himself who speaks no word for himself and then say where his himself is that himself is known to him only so long as he thinks acts or speaks for himself if he is only conscious of others of the universe and of the all where is his himself it is gone forever karma yoga therefore is a system of ethics and religion intended to attain freedom through unselfishness and by good works the karma yogi need not believe in any doctrine whatever he may not believe even in god may not ask what his soul is nor think of any metaphysical speculation he has got his own special aim of realizing selfishness and he has to work it out himself every moment of his life must be realization because he has to solve by mere work without the help of doctrine or theory the very same problem to which the gyani applies his reason and inspiration and the bhakt his love now comes the next question what is this work what is this doing good to the world can we do good to the world in an absolute sense no in a relative sense yes no permanent or everlasting good can be done to the world if it could be done the world would not be this world we may satisfy the hunger of a man for 5 minutes but he will be hungry again every pleasure with which we supply a man may be seen to be momentary no one can permanently cure this ever recurring fever of pleasure and pain can any permanent happiness be given to the world in the ocean we cannot raise a wave without causing a hollow somewhere else the sum total of the good things in the world has been the same throughout in its relation to man's need and greed it cannot be increased or decreased take the history of the human race as we know it today do we not find the same miseries and the same happiness the same pleasures and pains the same differences in position are not some rich some poor some high some low some healthy some unhealthy all this was just the same with the egyptians the greeks and the romans in ancient times as it is with the americans today so far as history is known it has always been the same yet at the same time we find that running along with all these incurable differences of pleasure and pain there has ever been the struggle to elevate them every period of history has given birth to thousands of men and women who have worked hard to smooth the passage of life for others and how far have they succeeded we can only play at driving the ball from one place to another we can take away pain from the physical plane and it goes to the mental one it is like that picture in dante's hell where the misers were given a mass of gold to roll up a hill every time they rolled it up a little it again rolled down all our talks about the millennium are very nice as schoolboy stories but they are no better than that all nations that dream of the millennium also think that of all people in the world they will have the best of it then for themselves this is the wonderfully unselfish idea of the millennium we cannot add happiness to this world similarly we cannot add pain to it either the sum total of the energies of pleasure and pain displayed here on earth will be the same throughout we just push it from this side to the other side and from that side to this but it will remain the same because to remain so is its very nature this ebb and flow 
this rising and falling is in the world's very nature it would be as logical to hold otherwise as to say that we may have life without death this is complete nonsense because the very idea of life implies death and the very idea of pleasure implies pain the lamp is constantly burning out and that is its life if you want to have a life you have to die every moment for it life and death are only different expressions of the same thing looked at from different standpoints they are the falling and the rising of the same wave and the two form one whole one looks at the fall side and becomes a pessimist another looks at the rise side and becomes an optimist when a boy is going to school and his father and mother are taking care of him everything seems blessed to him his wants are simple he is a great optimist but the old man with his varied experience becomes calmer and is sure to have his warmth considerably cool down so old nations with signs of decay all around them are apt to be less hopeful than new nations there is a proverb in india a thousand years a city and a thousand years a forest this change of city into forest and vice versa is going on everywhere and it makes people optimists or pessimists according to the side they see of it the next idea we take up is the idea of equality these millennium ideas have been great motive bars to work many religions preach this as an element in them that god is coming to rule the universe and that then there will be no difference at all in conditions the people who preach this doctrine are mere fanatics and fanatics are indeed the sincerest of mankind christianity was preached just on the basis of the fascination of this fanaticism and that is what made it so attractive to the greek and the roman slaves they believed that under the millennial religion there would be no more slavery that there would be plenty to eat and drink and therefore they flocked round the christian standard those who preached the idea first were of course ignorant fanatics but very sincere in modern times this millennial aspiration takes the form of equality of liberty equality and fraternity this is also fanaticism true equality has never been and never can be on earth how can we all be equal here this impossible kind of equality implies total death what makes this world what it is lost balance in the primal state which is called chaos there is perfect balance how do all the formative forces of the universe come then by struggling competition conflict suppose that all the particles of matter were held in equilibrium would there be then any process of creation we know from science that it is impossible disturb a sheet of water and there you find every particle of the water trying to become calm again one rushing against the other and in the same way all the phenomena which we call the universe all things therein are struggling to get back to the state of perfect balance again a disturbance comes and again we have combination and creation inequality is the very basis of creation at the same time the forces struggling to obtain equality are as much a necessity of creation as those which destroy it absolute equality that which means a perfect balance of all the struggling forces in all the planes can never be in this world before you attain that state the world will have become quite unfit for any kind of life and no one will be there we find therefore that all these ideas of the millennium and of absolute equality are not only impossible but also that if we try to carry them out they will lead us surely enough to the day of destruction what makes the difference between man and man it is largely the difference in the brain nowadays no one but a lunatic will say that we are all born with the same brain power we come into the world with unequal endowments we come as greater men or as lesser men and there is no getting away from that prenatally determined condition the american indians were in this country for thousands of years and a few handfuls of your ancestors came to their land 
what difference they have caused in the appearance of the country why did not the indians make improvements and build cities if all were equal with your ancestors a different sort of brain power came into the land different bundles of past impressions came and they worked out and manifested themselves absolute non differentiation is death so long as this world lasts differentiation there will and must be and the millennium of perfect equality will come only when a cycle of creation comes to its end before that equality cannot be yet this idea of realizing the millennium is a great motive power just as inequality is necessary for creation itself so the struggle to limit it is also necessary if there were no struggle to become free and get back to god there could be no creation either it is the difference between these two forces that determines the nature of the motives of men there will always be these motives to work some tending towards bondage and others towards freedom this world's wheel within wheel is a terrible mechanism if we put our hands in it as soon as we are caught we are gone we all think that when we have done a certain duty we shall be at rest but before we have done a part of the duty another is already in waiting we are all being dragged along by this mighty complex world machine there are only two ways out of it one is to give up all concerns with the machine to let it go and stand aside to give up our desires that is very easy to say but is almost impossible to do i do not know whether in 20 millions of men one can do that the other way is to plunge into the world and learn the secret of work and that is the way of karma yoga do not fly away from the wheels of the world machine but stand inside it and learn the secret of work through proper work done inside it is also possible to come out through this machinery itself is the way out we have now seen what work is it is a part of nature's foundation and goes on always those that believe in god understand this better because they know that god is not such an incapable being as will need our help although this universe will go on always our goal is freedom our goal is unselfishness and according to karma yoga that goal is to be reached through work all ideas of making the world perfectly happy may be good as motive powers for fanatics but we must know that fanaticism brings forth as much evil as good the karma yogi asks why you require any motive to work other than the inborn love of freedom be beyond the common worldly motives to work you have the right but not to the fruits thereof man can train himself to know and to practice that says the karma yogi when the idea of doing good becomes a part of his very being then he will not seek for any motive outside let us do good because it is good to do good he who does good work even in order to get to heaven binds himself down says the karma yogi any work that is done with any the least selfish motive instead of making us free forges one more chain for our feet So the only way is to give up all the fruits of work to be unattached to them know that this world is not we nor are we this world that we are really not the body that we really do not work we are the self eternally at rest and at peace why should we be bound by anything it is very good to say that we should be perfectly non attached but what is the way to do it Every good work we do without any ulterior motive instead of forging a new chain will break one of the links in the existing chains. Every good thought that we send to the world without thinking of any return will be stored up there and break one link in the chain and make us purer and purer until we become the purest of mortals. Yet all this may seem to be rather quixotic and to philosophical more theoretical and practical i have read many arguments against the bhagavad gita and many have said that without motives you cannot work they have never been unselfish work except under the influence of fanaticism and therefore they speak in that way 
Let me tell you in conclusion a few words about one man who actually carried this teaching of karma yoga into practice. That man is Buddha. He is the one man who ever carried this into perfect practice. All the prophets of the world except Buddha had external motives to move them to unselfish action. The prophets of the world with this single exception may be divided into two sets. One set holding that they are incarnations of God come down on earth and the other holding that they are only messengers from God. And both draw their impetus for work from outside except reward from outside. However, highly spiritual may be the language they use. But Buddha is the only prophet who said, "I do not care to know your various theories about God." What is the use of discussing all the subtle doctrines about the soul? Do good and be good, and this will take you to freedom and to whatever truth there is. He was in the conduct of his life absolutely without personal motives, and what man worked more than he? Show me in history one character who has soared so high above all. The whole human race has produced but one such character. such high philosophy such wide sympathy this great philosopher preaching the highest philosophy yet had the deepest sympathy for the lowest of animals and never put forth any claims for himself he is the ideal karma yogi acting entirely without motive and the history of humanity shows him to have been the greatest man ever born beyond compare the greatest combination of heart and brain that ever existed the greatest soul power that has ever been manifested he is the first great reformer the world has seen he was the first who dared to say believe not because some old manuscripts have produced believe not because it is your national belief because you have been made to believe it from your childhood but reason it all out and after you have analyzed it then if you find that it will do good to one and all believe it live up to it and help others to live up to it he works best who works without any motive neither for money nor for fame nor for anything else and when a man can do that he will be a buddha and out of him will come the power to work in such a manner as will transform the world this man represents the very highest ideal of karma yoga